Sebastian Alexander. Sebastian was perfect and he had a full head of black hair. From his nose up, he looked exactly like his daddy. Below his nose and to his chin, he looked just like me. He had my lips and he had my mom's ears. <laughs> so he just looked so cute. Welcome to Still a Part of Us, a place where moms and dads share the story of their child who was stillborn or who died in infancy. I'm Winter. And I'm Lee. We are grateful you joined us today. Please note that this is a story of loss and has triggers. Thanks to our lost parents who are willing to be vulnerable and share their children with us. If you're listening to this podcast, just know that on our YouTube channel, there are pictures and videos that are related to the stories that are being shared. Subscribe and share it with a friend that might need it and tell them to subscribe. Why? Because people need to know that even though our babies are no longer with us, they're still a part of us. Welcome to Still a Part of Us. We are grateful that you are here joining us today. And I especially extend a warm welcome to Stephanie who is the mom of Sebastian. And so thank you, Stephanie, for taking the time today to be with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to talk about him. Yeah, we always love that chance, don't we? (laughs) Yes. Okay, to give us a little bit of context for um, your story, um, how long ago was Sebastian born, just at the time of this recording? So at the time of this recording, just five days ago was 21 months. Oh, okay. and. So tell me a little bit about yourself and your family, what that looks like right now, and then maybe at the time of when you had Sebastian. So it is myself and my husband, Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Sebastian is actually named after my husband. Um, It's actually my husband's middle name is Sebastian, so we gave him his first name. Okay. Um, And we have two puppies that Mm. aren't really puppies anymore. They're 11 years old. (laughs) Okay. And... (laughs) They are, we start, we call them our starter children because they definitely keep us on our, their, our toes. <laughs> yes. And they're pretty, I'm sure little puppies are very hyper, very, take a lot of work and <laughs> energy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. They're rat terriers. So they have tons of energy, even oh. though they're senior dogs, technically now they run around just like they did when they were like six months old. No big deal. It's not, yeah. not a problem. <laughs> And uh, where are you guys, like, where are you guys based out of in the country? And um, can you give me a little bit of an idea of, like, what you guys like to do in your spare time as a as a couple and as a family as do- with dogs? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we are just outside of Tampa, Florida. Okay. Um, and we're about 20 minutes outside of Tampa. And um, lately, we have really been enjoying going to Universal uh, just because it's oh. super close. Um, yeah. Totally great. So we have. Yeah, we have passes for it. So we go there a lot. And then we're also really big Disney people. So we typically like to stay on property at Disney. Awesome. So fun. Yes. And when it's not as hot as it is currently, we, we like to go hiking and things like that and enjoy like Florida. But currently it's like an oven. So yeah. you're like, we are just going to hang out at a home. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. And uh, what do you guys, what do you do for a living uh, as for work? Um, so I work for one of the major U S banks. Um, at the time that Sebastian was born, I was a personal banker. And then since I'm now a branch operations manager, um, which is kind of like an assistant manager. Um, and yeah, I mean, I enjoy that, but that keeps you busy. Probably. I mean, you're probably working, you know, your typical 40 plus hours week as Mm -hmm. (laughs) being in leadership. (laughs) Exactly. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Okay, well, and then, um, and how long have you and Sebastian been together as a couple? Oh, um, a long time. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, <laughs> so okay. We're high school sweethearts. Oh, um, we started dating in 2006, mm-hmm. which I'm told that when my husband talked to Lee, he could not remember the year. So I think that's funny. <laughs> um, <It happens. laughs> but yeah, dating since 2006, but we've actually known each other since we were really young. Mm. Um, our families, my husband's from Columbia and so is my family. Oh, awesome. um, so when he came to the States, uh, with his mom, we kind of just built in like they, because they were family friends, they were just always at stuff. So we've known each other since we were like 11 or 12. That's so fun. 
Yeah. <laughs> Okay. So we're and then, basically and the, children, yeah. Yeah, okay. But that's uh, that is that is super fun to have like that friendship first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then like you said, high school sweethearts and then you guys got married afterward. Yeah, my husband um joined the military um mm-hmm. pretty much right out of high school. So I was married like 6 months after I graduated high school. Oh, okay. Okay. So I was 19 and he was 20. So yeah. literal children not knowing what the heck we were doing. And then we just made a life and it's been hard sometimes, certainly, but great. Yeah. yeah. Is he, um, is he gone a lot for his military appointment? Cause I know sometimes he, it changes and, and mm-hmm. there's deployments and such. Yeah. So he used to be, he's actually out in the Navy now. Oh, okay. Um, he actually works for a different bank. Um, oh. but, um, when he was in the Navy still, he was gone. Like the first year we were married, he was gone almost 300 days of the first oh. year. Oh, that's, that's mm-hmm. rough. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, how did your, so when you got pregnant with Sebastian, was that something that you guys were planning on mm-hmm. getting pregnant? Was tell me a little bit about your kind of family planning. Yeah. Well, so Um, initially because we got married so young and I have two younger brothers that are much younger than me, they're like 12 and 14 years younger than Mm -hmm. I am. I kind of wanted a break from helping raise kids. So (laughs) that's understandable. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, um, we waited for probably almost six years, um, before we even thought we wanted to start trying. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when we were ready to start trying, we had difficulties. So we did have some fertility issues. Okay. Getting diagnosed with infertility within the military, like insurance is like oh. an act of Congress. Like it's really? awful. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, so was it just, I guess it probably was a lot of, okay, you got to get referred to this person and then this mm-hmm. person and then this person it just kept kind mm-hmm. of just took forever. It sounds like exactly. Yeah. So you have to get referred to a specialist, but they also make you actively try for a year. Like unless you're over oh. a certain age, okay. um, they make you actively try for a year before you can even like see a fertility specialist. And then during that process of actively trying for a year, your primary care will probably change two or three times and then um. start you over because they are in the military and they've been deployed deployed or restationed or you know those types of things so oh that was not great crazy Mm -hmm. yeah okay so so so, happened (laughs) yeah I was gonna say so you guys tried for a little while and then Mm -hmm. you realized okay there's something going on we are not pregnant Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you went through the process of trying again for another year in order to get referred exactly yes Uh, Oh, that's like, it just feels like so much time wasted also. And yes, mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. And um, so you guys finally did get in though too. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we finally were able to, um, we were in Pensacola at the time, finally, mm-hmm. um, cause that's where we were stationed at the time. And we were able to get with a specialist. Um, mm-hmm. they had a partnership, uh, with a fertility clinic that was local, that was civilian. And I was diagnosed with polycystic ovary syndrome. Okay. Um, yeah. which also going back to my husband's conversation with Lee, I'm pretty sure he misstated the acronym. So oh. <laughs> just FYI. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um I have plastic ovary syndrome, um, mm-hmm. which kind of really makes sense, like my whole life, like looking back now that I have a diagnosis, because I do have really irregular periods. Mm. I have um, like a lot of facial hair that I have to like wax or shave. And I just always thought I was like, you know, I'm Hispanic. We are sometimes hairier. Like I never really Mm -hmm. thought anything of it, but as I got older and symptoms got worse, I was like, "Mm, yeah, this isn't like something must be off. Yes. Um, so there's a lot of different symptoms that go, I'm insulin resistant Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. like things like that. So getting on medication and kind of understanding the hormone imbalance and like what was really causing the infertility was really paramount and just getting my health better in general was a good, good thing. That was like, mm-hmm. a, yeah. Okay. So how long did that take to get diagnosed? Just the PCOS? Probably about 
about another year, I would say just of like testing and they wanted to confirm with ultrasounds, like look at my ovaries. Mm -hmm. We attempted an IUI, an intrauterine um, insemination. Okay. During that time period, um, before we left Pensacola, I did kind of go through, I was doing like the whole beach body was like a fad at the time. Yeah. So I was doing that and losing a lot of weight. Okay. Which helps alleviate a lot of the symptoms. So we actually did get pregnant naturally. Oh, you um, did? On accident. Mm-hmm. Okay. We weren't even planning it or anything. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we didn't realize, or I didn't realize that I was pregnant because we weren't trying. And I never missed a period because I don't get them. Yes. You didn't even notice anything different. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So then I was having really bad cramps and it was like a really, really bad period. And I was actually miscarrying. Um, within those first like few weeks. Yeah. Um, so so I didn't find out that I was even pregnant until I was losing it, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so sorry. That is, yeah, it's, it's always a shock when you're like, oh yeah, Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, after that point though, um, so you realized, okay, like I got pregnant or was able to get pregnant. Yeah. IUI didn't work right? Mm -hmm. You had one episode of the IUI. So that's if for people that don't know what that is, that's intrauterine um, insemination, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So it's like, they call it the turkey baster. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds really. Okay. So then after that, what was your, what was the next uh, steps in, in that journey? We kind of took a little bit of a break, so to speak. My husband was getting out of the military at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, we were kind of, he was going to be going back to school to finish his degree and things. So we were kind of in a transitioning period. So we were just going to hold off. Like if it happened, great. But if it didn't, it was probably better. We were going to be moving. So we moved back to the Bay area where we're from. Oh, Um, so we just kind of took a little bit of a break and just kind of took the pressure off and we were like, we'll come back to it once we get settled in, in Tampa. Okay. And was that a good break? Like, did you feel okay about that? Any anxiety or impatience? <laughs> yes, definitely impatience. Cause I felt like, and I still struggle with this and talk about it with my therapist of like, my body is kind of working against me or like it's betraying me in some way. Yeah. Um, so kind of working through like, why won't you just do what you're supposed to do? Supposed to do. Like, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then when you guys did get, so you hung out in the Bay area and then headed back to Tampa Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is that, and that's where you guys are at right now. So, Mm -hmm. um, when you guys transitioned back over, then is that when you tried to actively get back, get back going on, um, yeah. So or trying to figure that out. Yeah. My aunt and uncle, um, had fertility issues, um, having my cousin and, Um, they had seen a fertility specialist that's here, um, Mm -hmm. in Tampa and really recommended him. So they loved him and, um, he was covered by my insurance. So (laughs) (laughs) not completely, obviously, but (laughs) right. But that's something, that's something. (laughs) Yes. It's something. Um, so went and saw him and did like a whole battery of tests Mm -hmm. and did the whole kind of gamut with him. And he was really optimistic on, um, you know, what we could do to try and conceive and thought that it would be fairly simple for us to conceive, um, Mm. with a little like nudge basically. Yeah. Just with my diagnosis, he didn't feel like we would need to like do the IVF or, you know, Mm -hmm. go into kind of those more invasive treatments. He really felt like just with, um, taking, oh, now I'm going to forget what my hormones were. I believe it was Prometrium and Femara. Okay. Mm -hmm. Possibly. Or letrozole. I've taken a lot of different yes. ones. That, I mean, that's kind of what <laughs> they do. Time. They just start throwing things at you sometimes to to make yes. sure that you're doing what you, I mean, like what something's happening down there. So exactly. So you, would you say that your PCOS was generally well, kind of getting under control, managed by that time? Yeah, for the most part, it was managed. Um, well, so this was 2019 at the time. So yes, okay. it was managed well, but that was right before the pandemic. Um, so I was eating really well. I was very active. Um, I was kind of paying attention to those things. The pandemic kind of put a little bit of a 
wrench and everything. <laughs> it shut everything down. I mean, yeah, if you were like, oh, I'm going to the gym, the gyms were closed. Exactly. You know, like there was just mm-hmm. a lot of things that made it more difficult to, to, to yeah, I, I, I see where you're coming from. <laughs> yeah. So going into like the actual treatment cycle. So this was the end of 2019 that we decided, okay, we're going to do all of this. We know what the treatment plan is going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, we were going on a cruise the end of 2019 and it was to the Caribbean. So my doctor said, okay, go have a great time before we start these cycles, but you have to wait until February because of the threat of Zika. So oh, yes. we were like, okay, like t- that's fine. Right. Like yeah. we've right. waited this long, you know? Yeah. So we went. And then COVID happened. So when we were due to go back to start a treatment cycle, it wasn't allowed. Like, I don't remember if the state of Florida said the Department of Health was like no new fertility cycles or if it was my clinic. I really don't remember at this point, but my fertility clinic was not doing If you were not actively in a cycle, you weren't starting a new one. Ooh, that is frustrating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause it kind of felt like, okay, we're ready. Like we've made the choice yeah. for my body to start. And it's like, nope, you can't. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. Cause everything really shut down like February, March ish for a mm-hmm. lot of people. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. And so then what, like, what did you guys do? Yeah. So we waited it out. And then a few months later, I actually think I'm getting my months mixed up, if I'm being honest. But a few months later, we like went back to the doctor um, finally, and we mm-hmm. were ready to start. No, that's right. Because it would have been actually almost a year later we went to start because February is when we started our cycle, the okay. beginning. And yeah, just after Valentine's Day of 2021. Um, okay. Okay. So we went back, we were ready, got all my meds ordered. Um I just had to do the oral hormones to bring on a cycle, mm-hmm. um, you know, prepare everything. And then to confirm that I actually did ovulate and release an egg, I had to do one injection, which I was a baby and could not do. I had my husband do it. <laughs> you got to do it. Um, do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I had Ovidrel, um, a dose, and then it was just, okay, well, enjoy and try and conceive. Okay. All right. I'm actually a little curious. So Especially, I I like to kind of talk about the pandemic also because the pandemic really like put a, it was hard for a lot Mm -hmm. of people and especially a lot of people that have have lost. I am wondering, was your husband able to come to some of those appointments at that time or was that, that was not allowed? I'm just curious what your part of the country was able or not able to do. Yeah. Um, so during those first appointments, while I was still um, under care of the fertility clinic, my husband wasn't able to go to any of those appointments. Okay. So yeah. anytime if he did like have questions or when we did finally conceive, like when those early ultrasounds, he was on FaceTime. Uh-huh. Um, so he couldn't, he couldn't come, but I mean, yeah. I was thankful that technology existed and he could FaceTime Completely. at least. Yeah. Um, so that, that was helpful. Okay. Okay. And then, so you started that first cycle and then you guys, did you get pregnant in that first cycle or how did that, right how away. did that happen? Really? Right away. Yeah. Right oh. away. It was like magic. It was crazy because the whole, the whole time it was like, oh my gosh, this really just happened. It was yeah. our very first cycle. It worked. I was so afraid that we, you know, didn't do something right. Yeah. And then I, there's the dreaded two week wait whenever yep. you're in fertility treatment. Mm-hmm. Um, So I literally was like, I just want to test. I just want to test. I just want to test. And so it was the Sunday after my brother's birthday. um, Mm -hmm. And we were going to go meet them for brunch, both of my brothers, um, before he went back to college. And so I took a pregnancy test first thing that morning so that it was, you know, my first morning bathroom. And yeah. my husband was in the shower and I really wanted so badly for it to be like some cute, like romantic, like I'm telling you we're pregnant. And yes. it was not, I couldn't wait. I was like, babe, are you out of the shower yet? And he go was on, like, on, going on. <laughs> he was like, no, like what's wrong? And I was like, just, just, just hurry up. And he's like, oh my gosh, we're pregnant, aren't we? And I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> we're pregnant. 
And it, I've taken, I feel like millions of pregnancy tests and they've always yeah. said not pregnant. So this one came back like so quickly, like, yeah, girl, you're pregnant. Really? That's awesome. And it's sometimes nice when you're like, oh, there's a definite line too, like, or whatever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is so, so great. So I'm sure you guys were just ecstatic. I would mm-hmm. be so, so excited. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we really were because of our like early loss previously, my husband did keep saying like, you're okay. We're, we're excited and we can be happy about this, but you're not pregnant until the baby comes out. Yeah. Like he was still very cautiously optimistic. And I kept saying like, you know, eventually I'm going to, sh- I'm going to really be pregnant. Like it's, yeah. it's not, and there, he was there's like, no, no but- hiding that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he kept saying like, okay, but, but we we're okay. We're okay. So yeah, that's interesting. Well, I mean, I guess it does. Yeah. Miscarriage makes you real cautious. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and so that's interesting that he was very, very cautious about that. Yeah. Okay. So then you guys uh, are were pregnant, and then tell me, did you did you tell anybody, or did you guys just kind of keep that chill and quiet, and then just go back to the fertility qu- clinic for follow up, um, or, or both? <laughs> yeah, kind of both. So I told my brothers that day because like oh. we met them a couple hours later, yeah, and yeah my little brothers are like everything. Like they're Mm -hmm. my guinea pig babies. They're, I love them. So I told them immediately and I was like, do not tell mom and dad. Like, (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) So sworn to secrecy. (laughs) Yes. So they were the only people that knew for a really long time. Mm -hmm. Um, I think my husband maybe told his cousin, that's like his brother early. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't quite remember how early, but for the most part, that's all that knew. Okay. Um, and then I called my fertility clinic. I did end up telling my boss almost right away because I was terrified. Yes. Um, so, and I was really like sick, not morning sickness, but not to like be crude, but really constipated. Like, Oh, okay. Yep. And that had happened with my previous pregnancy as well. And I just didn't realize that that was a symptom of pregnancy, Yeah. but I just got really, really constipated. So yeah. I had to tell her like, I don't feel good. So yeah. she was like, what's going on? And I was like, okay, well actually I'm pregnant and I need to go to the bathroom, but I can't go to the bathroom. Right. Might be a minute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, but other than that, we really waited to tell people until about, it was Easter is when we first started telling people um, so a few months later. Yeah. A couple of months later, we told people and I told um, my cousins, we are godparents to one of my um, cousin's daughters. Uh huh. So we had had um, my cousins over and, you know, all the little kiddos. Um, I call them my nieces because it's just easier. So we had my yes. nieces over and my nephew and we did an Easter egg hunt. And I had put like little candy and stuff and just like little plastic Easter eggs and put them in our front yard. And then I had one golden egg and in the golden egg, it had a little thing that said baby. And so I told my cousins, I was like, whichever kiddo gets the golden egg, their mom gets to open the special egg to tell them what the surprise is. Yeah. And so my goddaughter ended up getting the golden egg. And so my cousin opened it and saw the little baby in it and she freaked out. She didn't even tell anybody else what she just started screaming and she like was jumping up down and she started hugging me and she's like, are you serious? Are you lying? Are you joking? And I was like, no, I'm really serious. (laughs) And then my other cousins are like, what is happening? Like, (laughs) What what is she? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so then finally she was like, she's pregnant. She has a baby in there. (laughs) Yay. Oh, that's so fun. That's always fun to tell people a little in a fun way like that. That's fun. Yeah. That's so mm-hmm. great. <laughs> and that's kind so. of a fun reaction too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's so it was funny. Um, and then we slowly just started telling people, like we told my grandparents um, a few weeks after that, and they were super excited. They were like jumping up and down because I think a lot of people like in our families just knew that we were struggling with this and yeah. um, we're really sensitive to the fact that we were struggling with fertility. So mm-hmm. when it finally happened for us and we've been together so long, yeah. um, they were just really excited for us. Oh, good. Yeah. When yeah, people root for you and that's so cool. That's great. And then you went, I, I think if you're at a fertility clinic, most of the time you are under their care for several more weeks. Mm-hmm. before gra- quote unquote graduating right onto yes. your regular OBGYN. So, so you, did you go back in and, and like get an ultrasound, do all the blood work and all that jazz? 
Yeah. And I was actually really excited because I didn't realize how quickly they would get me in for an ultrasound and I could actually see his heartbeat. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was within, I want to say like a week, maybe two of finding out we were pregnant. Um, they had me come in obviously right away for a blood test and mm-hmm. to confirm it that way. But then I was able to actually see his heartbeat for the first time. And it was just this little tiny circle and this mm-hmm. little tiny pulse. Like, dee, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, and a little flicker, and I I recorded it, and I was and I was watching it back the other day, and mm-hmm. I was like, "This is real. This is really my baby. Like, he's really in there." Mm-hmm. And I knew he was a he the whole time. Like, oh. I I just knew it in my soul that he was a boy. Really, mm-hmm. I love when people feel. Yeah, they just know. <laughs> I think it's yeah. fascinating. That's so cool. Mm-hmm. You probably so you finally graduated from fertility clinic were were all the other appointments and everything with them good how was everything progressing as it should yeah everything was progressing really well um i also didn't even realize at the time that i would graduate from a fertility clinic like oh gotcha I don't, it just never occurred to me i don't i just didn't give it any thought so right, right. when my doctor was like okay so yeah you you're good to go like you can go to your regular obgyn and you know call us when you deliver and i was like wait, what? You're not going to deliver my baby? And he was like, uh, no, <laughs> that's, nope. that's not what we do here. <laughs> yeah. We get you pregnant and then we don't want to yeah. deal with the delivery. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so then he actually recommended my OB because he had helped her, um, conceive her twins. Oh, So great. he recommended the practice and the specific doctor. So at that point I had just, trusted him and, you know, had such a relationship and with him that I was like, okay, well, I trust your opinion. I trust what you're saying to me. So Mm -hmm. I did do research. Like I looked at reviews. It turns out my boss actually sees um, the same practice. She sees a different doctor, but goes to the same exact practice. Oh, that's Um, awesome. So, and it's super close to work. So it would be easy for me to like, you know, take a lunch break and go to my, you know, your appointment, appointment, monthly appointments, whatever. So it just worked out really well to just go to to them. Awesome. So that transitioned okay as well then. And when you trans- transitioned over to that OBGYN, did you guys have any additional ultrasounds besides like maybe the the body scan uh, at 20 weeks, around 20 weeks? We did have a few ultrasounds. Um, oh, good. It wasn't out of the norm. They were just like a couple um, just because I wasn't quite high risk at that point because I didn't do IVF. Um, okay. But just, I guess, because I'm not sure if it's because my PCOS or or whatnot, but oh. um, we did have a couple more scans. And then we did have, we did our anatomy scan a little bit early. We did a sneak peek. Um, oh, okay. Because we wanted to see the gender because yeah. we wanted to go on a baby moon early. So we went on a baby moon like July. So we had gone to Disney and we have a timeshare over there on Disney property. So we went and stayed over there at one of the resorts and went to the um, Art of Animation Resort, which has like all of the characters yes. and stuff like that. Yeah. And so we went to the part of the resort that has Pride Rock, like from Lion yes. King. Yeah. Because we thought it would be funny to like play the Lion King music and reveal the gender. Yeah. So we worked with our friends that we asked to be um, Sebastian's godparents to like, they, would know the gender. It turned out just his godmother did. She didn't let his godfather in oh. on the secret because <laughs> she thought he would tell us. Um, oh, that's fair. Or he would like let it slip. He would spill yeah. beans. Yeah. So she planned it um, and my brothers were able to make it out. My dad came um, and then them. And she hid blue balloons like in this cute box that said like boy or girl. And like we did like a Facebook live for our family and we opened the box and I didn't even really let for all of the balloons to come out. Like I let like one balloon slip and yeah. I saw that it was blue and I started yeah. screaming and like jumping yeah. up and down. And then finally, like I hugged my husband and we like calmed down and then we opened the rest of the box and like yeah. it was blue. But it was funny because we like drew a crowd, like people Be- started stopping at the resort yeah. and they were like, what, what is happening? What's going, on? what's going on? And then people started seeing like, oh yeah, what are you having? This is cool. So oh, fun. Yeah. yeah that's so, so fun. <laughs> And that's a kind of a fun place. I was like, that is cool. That is that is funny. And I really just like that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you guys had 
you got finally confirmation that he was a boy and uh, Sebastian would be a boy. Did you did you guys have his name sort of in your brain? Were you guys kind of like making a list already? Yeah. So I think I've had my baby names for the most part picked out since we were in high school, since we did in high school. Perfect. Perfect. (laughs) They've changed a little bit because certainly your tastes change a little bit. Oh, yeah. For the most part. Um, Originally, we wanted to name him Juan because that's my husband's first name is Juan. And um, his he's actually named after his dad. And that's actually my dad's first name as well. He doesn't go by it. Yeah. As we got older, those relationships are a little bit more complicated. Um, and my husband goes by Sebastian mostly anyways. Yeah. Um, so we decided to change his first name to Sebastian, but we have always wanted his middle name to be Alexander. It's my brother, my eldest of my two younger brothers. Oh. It's his middle name, which I also picked out. I just like the name. And <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so great. I stole it. Yeah. But like, also we'll like it. I asked him, like he was, he felt good about it, that That's he would cute. have like, you know, my firstborn would have one of his names. So yeah. Um, so sweet. So yes, we've had that picked out for quite some time. So, and we've had, we had a girl name picked out as well that, um, just in case case he was a girl. And I remember too, it's funny, like thinking back, I told my husband, I was like, I'm, I've been working on my face because I'm very, um, if I'm upset, you know, I'm upset. Like I'm very expressive in my face. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. I remember telling my husband, I've been practicing, but I'm controlling my face because if she ever sees the video, I never want her to think she wasn't wanted because, right. you know, this baby is wanted regardless yeah. of their gender. Yeah. And when my cousin had my goddaughter, she wanted a boy. Um, oh. So she obviously is obsessed with her daughters, but she you could tell she was disappointed when oh. she found out that <laughs> it was another girl. That, that was some good forethinking about, like, controlling your face. <laughs> Yeah. So I was prepared. I had trained. If it was a girl, I was me just as excited. That is great. That is great. I love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, let's go jump back to your anatomy scan. How mm-hmm. did Sebastian look at that anatomy scan? And was your husband able to come to that appointment? Because that's a big mm-hmm. deal appointment, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the good thing, once we got graduated to the OBGYN, he was able to come to every appointment. Oh, good. Um, you could only have one person with you. So right. okay. typically it's your partner. But yes. at that time, like restrictions had not been all the way lifted, but they were a little bit more lenient. So he was able to go. We did still have to wear masks every time that we went to the doctor. Yes. Anytime you were in the doctor's office, really anytime you were anywhere still at that point, you had to wear masks. Mm-hmm. Um but he was able to go to all those. So he was able to go. He went to almost every ultrasound for the pregnancy. Actually, he went to pretty much all the appointments in general, I think, for the most part. But the anatomy scan looked great. There was nothing um, on the scan that was alarming. He was growing like he should. He, if I jumped to where we did the sneak peek, because we did a 16-week sneak peek and then we did the 20-week anatomy scan. Oh, gotcha. Okay, so you got um, to see him twice, like, fully. Yes. So I actually have a ton of ultrasound pictures of him, like a bunch. Oh, great. But the 16 week was funny because uh, my husband didn't go to that one. So Mm -hmm. I would like, didn't look at the screen most of the time because I didn't want to accidentally see the gender. Yeah. And Sebastian was not cooperating. Like he kept having his legs closed. He was like turned the wrong way. Yeah. He just, he was not wanting to give it up at all. So I kept having to move. So like she had me move to my side and then she had me, you know, move to the other side and try to sit up and then lay back down. And it was funny because I was like, oh my gosh, like all of this, I, I'm now like my back hurts, my side hurts. And I've been contorting. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) She was like, if this doesn't work, then I'll have you go in the waiting room and drink some juice and then we'll try again. Um, but then finally she was like, oh, there it is. Okay. Yes. I was able to see the gender. Okay. And I'm okay. like, I was like, I don't want to look, I don't want to look. <laughs> but I kind of want to look. <laughs> but then, um, then a couple weeks later when we did the anatomy scan, everything was great. You know, we, they could see his fingers and his toes and his spine and everything looked good. No cause for alarm. That's great. That is always nice. To have. Like, okay. It was got a clean bill of health at that time. Mm-hmm. How are you feeling at this time? I know that you kind of mentioned that you had some issues with constipation, but how are you uh-huh. feeling by it? Because that's about midway point. Uh-huh. Um, how were how were things looking for you health wise? Yeah, health wise, I really felt great. Um, oh, good. I typically for my PCOS do take metformin, mm-hmm. and 
at some point I did ask in passing, like, should I still be taking that? Or, yeah. and they said, no, like you're typically, you're fine. You don't need to take it. And it, it wasn't my doctor. It was like one of the other doctors okay. and it was just very, um, nobody seemed stressed about it. It just seemed fine. So I went off of the metformin. So I, okay. I stopped taking it. Uh, and the metformin is usually, um, for insulin resistance for, yeah. to control any, um, like blood sugar and thing issues and stuff yeah. like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah. So I just, everything was good. I had no, I had heartburn, you know, normal stuff, yes. but other than that, I mean, it, it was a pretty easy pregnancy. Right. That's, that's awesome. As you started to get, as you progressed in your time, did you know, I mean, were you paying attention to his movements? Like, um, was that something that your doctor told you about to t- kind of pay attention to? Yeah. So they, I met with the midwife kind of closer, like in the third trimester. Mm-hmm. Um, and cause my particular practice has, you see every single doctor and the midwife. So you're oh. familiar with all of them. So that way, whoever's on call at the time of your birth, like you've, it's not a stranger. Exactly. Okay. That's great. I think it's great. So <laughs> yeah, I definitely, well, and it came in handy later, but, um, mm-hmm. I definitely loved that. So I met with the midwife and I was asking her cause, um, at the time the, the, uh, the operations manager, when I was still a banker at my branch, she was pregnant at the same exact time. Oh, okay. She was like a month ahead, but she is in her forties. Um, so she was high risk. So she did like a lot of testing that they didn't yes. make me go through. Cause I'm, I was only 32 at the time. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was asking about things like that and she was like, yeah, she was like, you know, you, you don't necessarily need, you know, those non-stress tests or things like that, but you do want to pay attention to the kick counts. And so she okay. gave me like a little pamphlet of the kick counts and, you know, how to do them and things to look for, but it seemed almost like it was a fun thing. Like it didn't, I don't know, maybe cause I still birth like seemed so far from yeah. reality for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it seemed like it was something that happened, you know, like in the middle ages or like exactly. maybe in the fifties, but yeah. certainly not in 2021. Not in this, yep. Not in this day and age. Right. Yeah. So I took it seriously. Like, you know, I was paying attention, but I just thought it was like a fun thing to like feel your baby, like feel how active they are. And oh. so I did them, but I, I just, I didn't realize like how much I should have paid attention to like what his patterns are and gotcha. like, not just how often he's kicking, but like the strength of these kicks and right. yeah, things like that. Okay. Well, that's interesting that, uh, that was not conveyed to you, but mm-hmm. yeah, just kind of spun a little differently. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's, let's move into then you're getting farther into your appointments. You're probably being seen a bit more frequently, right? You're getting kind of closer to your due date, which was, tell me again, your due date. My due date was November 20th. Okay. November 20th. So, um, can you tell us a little bit as we get a little bit closer, like, um, noticing anything different or any changes in your health or his health, um, as you get closer to his due date? Um, yeah. So, I mean, everything was really good. Honestly, like not a lot of changes. We had our baby shower in September. Okay. Um, cause I'm definitely a planner. So I wanted to like get all of, you know, gifts everything. and furniture right. and everything like well ahead of Set time up. because yeah. for the month of October, I wanted to just be fully in like put everything ne- together mode and like have Nesting the nursery mode. done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we had our baby shower Labor Day, um, okay. Labor Day weekend. And so I had a baby shower and my husband also had a diaper party. Um, Mm -hmm. so he had a party like with his friends and, and that, and then we did all the like, you know, girly stuff at my baby shower. So it was super fun. But my aunt, um, she kept saying like, you are so big and like, not in a mean way. Like I love my aunt, like she's amazing, but she kept saying like, your belly is so big. Like they've got to have your due date wrong. They've got to have your due date wrong. Oh, and I was like, no, I mean, like, I literally know probably within a couple of days when I conceived, like yeah. my due date is right. Like there's, there's no way, but she just kept saying like, she thought that I was so much larger than that. I had like two months huh. still to go. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know. We really didn't think anything of it. My doctor had been measuring my belly. Like I, this was my first pregnancy that I've ever gotten, you know, this far, like, right. so for all intents and purposes, my first pregnancy. So I didn't think anything of it. 
Right. You don't um, have anything to compare it to. That's the other thing. People don't realize that like mm-hmm. you just don't know how to react sometimes when people say stuff like that or. Yeah, or exactly. Because I'm like, how you're supposed okay, to mm-hmm. thanks. Like, yeah. <laughs> Good. So, maybe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so baby shower was great. Uh, we had just a lot of fun. We got everything we needed. And then I would say like probably o- the month of October, it felt like like my boss kept saying like, I feel like you got bigger overnight because I was carrying really small the beginning part of my pregnancy. Okay. Um, and at 36 weeks, we had our last ultrasound because typically you don't really have ultrasounds in the third trimester because it's yeah. like if you're not high risk, like it's not really necessary, which and, yeah. I found out is a U.S. thing. It's not the same in other countries. Oh, Their okay. prenatal care is different and like more monitored, like they observe way more, which yeah. I find super interesting. But at 36 weeks, they measured him because they wanted to make sure he wasn't still breached because the entire time he was breached. Oh. So they wanted to make sure that he had finally flipped. Gotcha. Um, so we did the ultrasound and everything looked really good. And he was only measuring like six pounds at that point, which everybody in my family was a really pretty small baby. Like I was a small baby. My husband was pretty average, like wasn't big by any means. Yes. So we didn't anticipate for him to be a large baby. Okay. Um, that was 36 so, weeks mm-hmm. and he was about six pounds. Yeah. Okay. So they told us at most um, he would probably grow another like two pounds, if that, at okay. most. Okay. And then, you know, he would probably be like a peanut. So the whole time, like, I thought, okay, this is my little peanut. Like, yeah. you know, he'll come out and he'll be a little baby. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I packed my hospital bag accordingly of Mm -hmm. thinking that he would be a peanut. Yeah. Newborn Um, outfit or whatever. Right. Exactly. So his heart rate looked good. Everything looked great. Um, and then from then on, I was seen every week, um, at these appointments, like they would, for the most part, measure my belly and see, but I noticed as we got closer to the due date, I think everybody kind of relaxes a little bit. And like, not to say that anybody's negligent, like, I don't think no. that that was my yeah. scenario, but it's just kind of like, okay, like you've made it this far. If the, the baby can be born anytime, you know? Yeah. So I do remember now, cause after something like this happens, you kind of think back and analyze every mm-hmm. second of the last nine months. Mm-hmm. So in thinking back after we lost him, I know that there was a couple of appointments where they didn't measure my stomach. Oh. And my boss kept saying, like, I feel like you grew overnight. Like, all of a sudden, you know, yeah. you're huge. And she's yeah. like, I'm not saying that, like, you're fat, but, like, just your belly. Because I didn't myself necessarily gain a ton of weight, but my stomach was huge. Like, was all getting... of a sudden, I had a ton of stretch marks. I didn't really have stretch marks during most of my pregnancy. Yeah. So it was pretty much, like... I would say right before we took our maternity pictures, all of a sudden I had stretch marks and I was just like, you know what? I feel powerful. I'm growing this baby. Like I've never felt more beautiful. Like yeah. I finally kind of felt really empowered in my body of mm-hmm. like, it's doing what it's supposed to. I'm, you know, bringing life. And I don't know, like I felt close to my husband, like everything just felt really magical and amazing. That's great. I I think that's, that's amazing. But it's, yeah, what like you said, like you just start thinking about things in the past and you kind of take those apart. And let's let's move into as you are when when things didn't turn out well. Tell, tell yeah. How the events that went up to that. So I took the last week of work off. Um, I'm customer facing. So I work in a branch. So I work with yes. customers every day. Mm-hmm. Um, customers can be impatient, certainly during the pandemic. So yeah. I would have to go to the bathroom a lot and things of that. And so like the Friday before I quit work, somebody was upset that I was taking too many bathroom breaks instead of helping customers. And I nearly lost it. (laughs) I was like, I'm very pregnant. Like what is wrong with you? Yeah. So I told my, my boss or I asked my boss rather, I was like, I don't think I can do this anymore. Like, I think I'm going to need some time off. And she kind of laughed and was like, I told you this the whole time. Like told you you were going to feel like this. Yeah. So, um, ended up, you know, going to the doctor, my blood pressure was a little bit high that last week before, like while I was still working. Okay. Um, so they were a little concerned. So they were like, you know what, just go ahead and take that last week. You're already feeling irritable. Your blood pressure is a little bit high. 
there wasn't, I guess they also look for like protein in your urine and things of that nature. So there wasn't anything there that they were like alarmed uh, for preeclampsia or anything like that, but they still were like, they wanted me to take it easy. Yeah. Just kind of be a little bit more cautious. Exactly. So I was like, great, let me take this week. I'm going to nest. I'm going to, you know, yeah. sleep because I probably won't sleep for months. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so I took that last week before our due date off and just kind of organized the house. I made all kinds of meals that were frozen that my husband could just throw in the instant pot. Yeah. Um, everything was prepared. Like the nursery was set up, the laundry was done. Like I made sure everything was perfect. So yeah. he could come at any time and we would just be in bliss. Like it would yes. be great. Yes. Which also looking back, like was probably not going to be reality, even if he was born alive, like, you know, (laughs) but you were um, just getting prepared. I think that's totally good. I think that's totally great. I think. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, so everything was really good. We um, prepared that last weekend. Um, He was born on a Sunday. So that Friday and Saturday, we were, you know, just kind of doing all of our like we had to get the dogs baths and um, they went to the groomers. And so we went to brunch and that Saturday uh, when we were at brunch waiting for our dogs to finish with groomers, I remember being realizing like, Oh, I haven't felt him yet. Cause I normally would feel him kind of wake up at like seven o'clock. Okay. And I hadn't really felt him move much. And so I was like, that's strange. Like, you know, he's usually awake by now. And then I was like, well, you know, we got an early start. I've been moving a lot. So maybe he, you know, I'm just moving. So he's sleeping, like it lulled him to sleep. Yeah. So at this point I'm thinking my, this is literally my due date. This Saturday was my due date. It's November Mm -hmm. 20th. So I'm like, you know, it's, I made it like I made it to the finish line, you know? So there can't be, there can't be anything wrong. So we go about our day, um, I did feel really just tired and exhausted. And at the time I just kind of chalked it up to I'm nine months pregnant, exactly. you know, I'm huge. <laughs> so that's gotta be the problem. So I took a nap and, but when I laid down, I told my husband like, oh, I'm going to go lay down. I'm going to do a kick count and then probably take a nap. So I got, you know, my little app ready and started to do the kick count. And as I was waiting for his first kick, I fell asleep because I was exhausted. Yeah. I, I never felt, you know, a movement. Um, I, I go back and think like I beat myself up about it of, you know, I shouldn't have fallen asleep. I should have paid closer attention. And, um, I woke up from the nap, you know, my mom called me and checked on me and, you know, she was excited. This is the first grandbaby. And, oh yeah. um, my boss had called and checked on me. So, you know, to wake me up and, you know, see what's, you know, have this baby coming today is, are they not? Um, and so my husband came in at that point and I was like, you know, I, I feel like I haven't felt the baby move. Like, I feel like I haven't felt him move a lot all day. And he was like, Oh, he's probably fine. Like you guys are just tired. He doesn't have a lot of room in there. Like it's, it's probably okay. And so he put his hand on my stomach and we kind of cuddled a little bit and he said, no, like he just pushed back on me. I felt it. And I did kind of feel him, or at least I think that I felt him. And so I was like, yeah, he, he just pushed back at his dad. Like that, that happened. Oh. And so okay, I still, to this day, can, I can't say like, did I really feel him or did I think I was feeling him or was it just because he was so big that it felt like he was pushing back and he gotcha. wasn't like, I honestly don't remember. I know for sure I felt him move on Friday evening and then I'm unsure. Like I go back and forth of, no, I did feel him on Saturday or no, I didn't feel him on Saturday. Gotcha. Uh, you felt him on Friday. Did you feel, you said that you were really tired on Saturday. Did you feel any of that tiredness on sen- uh, Friday or into the no, night? Does that make sense? Friday, you yeah, no, fine. Friday I felt great. I but it was felt, just Saturday. Yeah, it was just Saturday. And we had just had an appointment on the Thursday before and his okay. heartbeat was great. Yeah. It was like 136 um yeah. his heart rate. So it was perfect. I remember at that appointment I did tell um the doctor that I saw I told her like hey so I do feel him like less. Like not less often I still feel him moving often but I don't really feel like big movements. Like it almost feels like he's nudging. And she was like, well, I mean, you know, he could be running out of room and you know, we did just hear the heartbeat so he is okay. 
but I didn't really push. Like I was kind of afraid to kind of admit anything. And so like, I also have guilt about that of like, I should have asked more questions because I was almost like, I, I let it off. Like it wasn't a big deal. And I feel like if I had made a bigger deal, then she would have probed more. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah. yeah, like I, I definitely within that last week, I, he wasn't, he would do these big dramatic movements. Like he was the baby that would have like his, his, you could see his hand going oh. across my belly or like, yeah. you know, and within that last week, it was much more like he would like move an elbow or like wiggle his butt. Like I could, he, his, his butt was like in my ribs, like the whole time. <laughs> so in that last month, so I would feel his butt, like Oof. hit me in the rib yeah. and yeah. like knock my wind almost, you know? Yeah. So, um, I didn't feel the butt wiggles or, you know, those were becoming less pronounced. Yeah. And I feel like if I had said to the doctor, I don't feel him as much then, you know, maybe they would have done an ultrasound. Maybe they would have seen something yeah. and you kind of go back to like, what could I have done differently? Like, how yeah. could I have saved him? You know? Yeah. I, it, and it, yeah, it's very easy to fall down that hole and yeah, it's, and that can be a really hard place to be though. So just, it's like, Oh, Saturday, you mentioned to, to your Sebastian, your husband. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to clarify that he, that you're like, uh, couldn't feel him that much. And, and, but then he's like, Oh, I, I think I just felt him. And you kind of think that you felt him as well. And then after that, how, what happened after that? Did you guys like just go along with the rest of your day? Yeah. So, um, at that point it was like dinner and we had planned to go on one last date night. So mm -hmm. I really, I hadn't had, um, I was really careful what I ate the whole time. Like I was terrified that I would do something wrong. So like I yeah. didn't eat cold cuts the whole time. Like I would yeah. microwave them if I wanted to make a sandwich. Like yeah. I wouldn't eat like a rare steak, even though I love medium rare yeah. steak. Like I was super cautious. So yeah. I really just wanted a steak. Like I was really craving a steak and a, a baked potato and like rolls from the steakhouse. Like I right. really wanted it bad. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. you're like, I have a craving. Let's do this. <laughs> yes, exactly. So we went on one last date night, you know, got all dressed up in my cute little maternity dress. And mm -hmm. um, we had a nice dinner and I was like, there's nothing that's good. That's going to, you know, derail us now. I can have the medium rare steak. Like we've made it to due date, right? We made it to the finish line. It's safe. We made it to the safe zone. And um so, you know, had our dinner, went to bed. And then that whole night, I just couldn't sleep. Like I couldn't get comfortable. My back hurt really bad. It felt like every time I would turn it, he was like a rock. Like my belly would just, all the pressure would go to one side and mm. it was just super heavy and super uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and so like, I didn't sleep well at all. I was exhausted that morning. Yeah. And my husband is an early riser. Like he's, he just always has been. Mm -hmm. So he woke up probably around seven, maybe earlier. And I got up right away and he was like, Oh, you don't want to sleep anymore. And I was like, I just can't sleep. Like I can't get comfortable. I don't mm -hmm. feel good. Mm -hmm. I just, I'll just get up with you. I'll just, you know, I'll sit on the couch. Maybe the recliner will help. And so as soon as I stood up out of bed, I just felt like all of the, like all his weight was in my pelvis. Like it felt like I had a bowling ball on my pelvis. Oh. It, it just hurt. And my whole body just felt off. Like it just, something was wrong. And so I went to the bathroom and I had a little bit of like yellowish discharge, which was odd. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was like, that's weird. And so like, I Googled it cause you know, yeah. Google is, you know, easiest. <laughs> yes. And yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, um, I Googled it and, you know, it, if, as long as there wasn't other symptoms, you know, going along with it, it just, it seemed fine. And I thought, you know, maybe it's my mucus plug or, you know, it's normal. Yeah. Uh, cause again, I have nothing to compare it to. So I was like, okay, well, I'll get up, I'll make breakfast. Like maybe if I eat something, I'll feel a little bit better and I can sleep. And my husband loves my pancakes. Like it's his <laughs> favorite thing that I make for breakfast. Mm -hmm. And I figured, probably not going to make him pancakes for a while. So let me make him one last good breakfast. Yeah. Um, cause we were set to be induced cause I didn't want to be very overdue. So we were set to be induced that coming Wednesday. Gotcha. So okay. like within three days. Okay. 
Um, and your and your plan was to go vaginal. Is that right? Is that I mean, I just wasn't sure your plan. Okay, so go vaginal birth. Yeah. Any medicated, unmedicated, any um Um, no. So I wanted to be unmedicated. Like okay. I was fully prepared for like I had done like the hypnobirthing. Okay. And okay. We had a plan. We had a safe word just in case it got really bad. So right. that he would know like I really meant it. I do yes. actually want drugs. Like, gotcha. Okay. Okay. I had prepped my mom because at that time, even with COVID, you could have one support person and then also your partner. Oh, okay. That's so, great. um, and we had been checking the whole time because uh at that point during COVID, it started to surge again. Right. In so, November. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we were I was checking with the hospital constantly of like, can my mom come? Can my mom come? Um, so she was prepared. Like if she couldn't come, she would just come stay with the dogs. Gotcha. And then I prepared her. I was like, I'm going to be in a lot of pain. You know, I might be very vocal, but like, you are not to try to talk me into having meds. Like right. you are to just support me yes. and help me through okay. it. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that was some so good we're... clear talking and <laughs> these, this is my preference. <laughs> yes. <good>. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, I was oh, really prepared can, for that. Can I ask you another question? He mm-hmm. had flipped by this time. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So he was headed in, he, his head was in the right direction. Okay. Yes. Yeah. He was head down. Okay. And so that Sunday, um, after breakfast, I still just didn't feel good. Like I just, my whole body just felt off. Like, I feel like my body was really trying to tell me like, Hey, something's really wrong here. Mm. And my dogs were even acting strange. Like I'm convinced that they knew that something was wrong. Like they were very, like, typically my male dog is very, like my lap dog, like he's very always at my feet, but my, um, my little girl, my female is, she's not off standish by any means, but she certainly usually gravitates more to my husband or she likes to kind of do her own thing. Like she yeah. okay. isn't necessarily all up on me. And both of them, anytime I would walk anywhere would not leave my side. Like I was almost tripping over them. They were oh. so attached that morning. Oh, um, interesting. And like, they were also like nipping at each other. Like if one of them got too close to me, the other would be like, no, I'm protecting her. Like it was super strange. They've never, never been like that or since. Yeah. So I told my husband, I was like, I'm going to go lay down and I'm probably going to call the doctor and just, you know, call the all call, all call nurse and Mm -hmm. um, just see what she has to say. And he was like, okay, like, you know, just let me know. And so he he was watching soccer or something or mm-hmm. some type of game. It was a Sunday morning. So he, yeah. I'm pretty sure it was soccer, but yeah, I went and laid down, called the on-call nurse and I kind of told her my symptoms. And at first I was like, you know, I just don't feel good. And, um, I told her about how the pressure in my pelvis and described it as like a bowling ball. And she, yeah. she kind of chuckled a little bit at that part and was like, yeah, that's, that's kind of what it comes. You're, you know, you're, you've passed your due date at this point. Like you are going to start feeling some pressure. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. And I was like, but, um, you know, I described my discharge and she was like, okay. And so then she kind of got a little bit more concerned and started asking me some more questions. Okay. Um, and then I mentioned, and I'm not really sure when the last time I felt him move was, and then she got really serious and she was like, okay, okay. So that with your discharge, I want you to go immediately to, oh. to triage. Okay. And so I was like, oh, oh, okay. And I was like, I mean, like, what do you mean? Like, then I started to kind of freak out a little bit and I was like, well, what, like, how should I go like immediately? Like, and she's like, okay, well, you don't like, you don't need to call 911, but like, you should probably get your bag together and just head over there. I'm going to call. And I was like, okay. So I then immediately just started cursing and dropping a bunch of F-bombs. And yeah, my yeah. husband was um, like, what's the matter? What's going on? And I really didn't want my son to be born on the 21st. I have a family member that passed away earlier that year uh-huh. and their death kind of fractured my, my whole family um, on mm-hmm. my dad's side. So that's his birthday. That's that oh. family member's birthday. Okay. And I never, I didn't want my son to like share his birthday with this family member, like his whole life. Like, and I didn't want them to be compared. Gotcha. Um, okay. So I just, you know, wanted him to have his own birthday. So my husband thought that that was why I was having that reaction. Cause the entire time, because my son's due date was so close to his birthday. They're like, that's um, a possibility for sure. Right. Yeah. 
So he was like, it's fine if he's born today, like, you know, he's going to come when he's going to come. And yeah. he thought that that why, was why I was having such like an outburst. And I was like, no, like something is wrong. I know that something's wrong. And he was like, okay. So we quickly like took showers and, you know, got the dog situated and then headed over. And the whole time that we were driving over to the hospital, I knew something was terribly wrong. But I had no idea that he had passed. Like it still was something that like had not entered my mind in any way. Like I thought like, you know, something's wrong and he's going to have to be in the NICU or he's in distress in some way. Right. Like right. they might have to do an emergency C-section or. Yeah. But I never thought that he had passed like that just it did not enter my brain at all that it was even a possibility because we yeah. had made it to our due date. Like we yeah. were safe. Yeah. We were in the clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we drove to the hospital and my husband, of course, cause he is, you know, has been married to my crazy super planner self had planned the fastest route to the hospital possible. <laughs> so we like Which took the awesome. back roads. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we took the back roads and, um, the back roads, um, in the suburbs of where we live are like through like a goat farm. Oh. So I'm like looking at goats and I'm like, okay, like everything's going to be okay. Like we've got this, like I can do it. And so we get to the hospital and I jump out of the car. My husband goes to park and I tell the people like, okay, so I'm pregnant. My doctor called ahead. I'm having some reduced movement. And as soon as I said reduced movement, like their faces drop. It's like everybody knew like this thing that happens and I had no clue. Like everybody else in the world knew in some way. Yeah. At that at that moment it felt like it knew that this was a thing that could happen except for me. Like it's like I wasn't in on the secret. Um and so finally the the you know little nurse or whatever comes with the wheelchair and takes us up to L and D. My husband had to go get like ID or something for security. So when yeah. I got to the triage room, I was by myself uh -huh. um, and the nurse brought in um, like a gown and, you know, had me get undressed and things like that. And so at that point, I'm just like out loud praying, like I was just begging God, like, just let everything be okay. Like I was afraid that something was wrong and like, I wasn't going to live through a delivery. Oh, okay. I like in this moment, like it still had not clicked that my baby could die. Like I was convinced that something terrible was happening, but like, it wasn't to him. Yeah. Like he was you know, fine. Right. Like he was fine. Like maybe my body was, you know, a uterus was going to rupture or like something terrible was going to happen. Yeah. But like he, he would live. So my husband, like, as soon as I got out of the bathroom, um, my husband was there. And so, you know, I got on the bed and the nurse came in and was trying to put, um, the monitors on my belly mm -hmm. and she was having a hard time finding the heartbeat. I have dealt with like some past trauma in my life. So I was just kind of grounding myself, like, so that I wouldn't spin into a panic attack. Cause I do have anxiety issues. So okay. I kind of like used those coping skills. Okay. Um, so I was just trying to be like, okay, what can I smell? What can I see? What can I, you know, touch and things like that. And, um, yeah, she wasn't able to find the heartbeat. And my husband was like, oh, well she has an anterior placenta. Cause I did. My placenta was right up at the front. Okay. Um, so in early pregnancy that made it difficult for them to find his heartbeat because right. he was like, you know, behind it. Yeah. And so I just kind of was like, yeah. Yeah. I have an anterior placenta. And she was like, okay. And like, in my mind, like deep down, I knew like, that doesn't matter at this stage. Like they can find his heartbeat at this stage. And then I kind of, it started to click like this, this is, he's not here, but I still was trying to like convince myself, like, you know, they'll, they'll find it. So she was like, okay, well, you know what? Let me get the charge nurse. And cause she's better at this sometimes. Like she was super sweet. This nurse was amazing. I'm going to get the charge nurse. She'll be able to, to help me out and to find his heartbeat. And so I was like, okay, great. So they, she came in really quickly. And so then they're still trying to do these monitors and they can't get him. So she's like, okay, we're going to call the doctor, the on-call doctor, and we're going to bring in an ultrasound. And so I was like, okay. 
And so I'm just trying to keep my cool. I'm not crying. I'm not doing anything. I'm breathing. And then the doctor comes in and this particular doctor, I had only met like once or twice. Like I knew her, she was familiar, but she was not my doctor. Right. So, and I feel almost like that was a blessing in disguise. Like it was, she was the right doctor. She was the doctor that was supposed to walk with me through this. Like I'm convinced. So she got the ultrasound machine. They're looking around and I can see him. And, you know, there's not any movement at all. And so then I start to really panic. And so I just was looking up at the lights, like the fluorescent lights. And I just was silently sobbing. Like I couldn't look at my husband. I couldn't do anything. He was just holding my hand and I'm just starting to like not breathe, honestly. And so a nurse that was initially helping us was just like rubbing my leg. And she was like, it's okay, mama, just breathe. Like we're going to find it. And after like just silence, I finally just like kind of blurted out, you can't find it, can you? And my doctor, she just kind of like inhaled sharply, like she was like trying to keep herself okay. And she was like, I'm so sorry. It's, I can't, it's, there's no heartbeat. And all I could do, there was like this outlet on the wall that had an Alexa because that was a new upgrade that the hospital had. Uh And all I could do was focus on that Alexa. Like that's all that I was looking at. And I was just like, okay, okay. And I couldn't respond. Like I was just so in shock. Yeah. I couldn't even say anything. And my husband he's not a crier at all. Like he's just not an emotional type of guy, but he let out this just like cry or like sound. Like it was like this very guttural primal sound that I've never heard anyone make before of just despair. And then he was just sobbing and I just couldn't, I couldn't even cry. Like at that point, I just was like, this isn't happening. Like this isn't hap. This is not happening to me. So she, you know, did some more scan, um, and hugged me and said, you know what, I, we need to get the, um, the hospital sonographer to come and do a scan and can just confirm my diagnosis. Um, and then I, I want to understand what's happened to you and what's happened to the baby. So I want to get measurements and she kind of like prepped me for what she was doing. Okay. Um, so she wanted to get measurements of the baby and of fluid and, you know, to try to start to like diagnostically understand what, what happened. Okay. Um, so as soon as, so they gave us a minute and they left the room. And as soon as they left the room, then I just started crying and like screaming. And I just kept apologizing to my husband because I felt like I had done this to us. Like, like, like it was my body that like, we had such a hard time getting pregnant and I convinced him to do the fertility treatments. And we had gone through this whole ordeal. And then I couldn't, I couldn't break, give him a baby. Like I couldn't bring our baby into the world. Um, And he just kept saying, like, it's not your fault. You didn't do this. Like, we we can get through this. We'll we'll figure it out. We'll find out what happened. And he was just amazing. Like, it's he just went into this like incredible dad mode. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so we just kind of cried and like held each other. And um, then they knocked on the door and it was like this whole team of people came in, like it was a team of nurses and they were taking blood and they were measuring me. And then the sonographer came in, um, 
and it was just kind of quiet and she took measurements and did like, you know, what felt like a really long time of an exam, but it probably wasn't. And then she said, she confirmed, like, I'm so sorry that this is happening to you. There is no heartbeat. So I'm going to confirm that with the doctor and the doctor will come back and speak with you and kind of talk about some of the things that I see in the scan. And our experience at the hospital, honestly, was incredible. Like, you know, aside from what was happening to us, just the compassion and the nurses and everybody we came into contact, like during that initial kind of shock was just so compassionate and loving and caring. And I really can't say enough good things about that part of the experience. So they took like a ton of blood and then they put, um, they gave me two IVs to like get me on fluids and in case they need like a second, like emergency line or whatever. Uh And so then my doctor came in and, um, she was like, so based off of the scan, um, we can see that, you know, baby has passed, but it looks like he's very large. Like I looked at your chart and at 36 weeks, he was only six pounds. And right now he's measuring 10. Whoa. Yeah. That was our reaction of what, what do you mean? Like, and so he had grown, he'd almost doubled what he was supposed to. Yeah. So, um, we were like, well, how does that happen? And so she, she was like, you know, we, I think that that's probably what led to this is he just had, um, too like rapid growth. He grew too quickly in that last, you know, month. Um, and it could have just been too much for his heart to take. Oh, really? So that was like our working kind of theory, Okay, you know, at the time. And so then she sent, they took more blood. And I honestly feel like at that point I was a blood bank, like all the files and everything that they were yeah. taking and testing yeah. and whirlwind of people. And so they tested my blood sugar and my blood sugar was through the roof. Like it was crazy high. Really? Um, yeah. So she was like, I'm in, I want to see what your A1C is. So of course, like that's not a quick test that they can nope. just do. Like they have to send it to the lab and stuff. Yeah. So um, they put a rush on it, but it still was going to take, you know, 24 hours. Mm-hmm. Then the theory started to kind of develop to, okay, so maybe you had gestational diabetes. Oh. I had tested for diabetes. Yeah. You took and the test, the glucose test. Yeah. And the normal okay. one. I had, mm-hmm. I did fail the first one, um, okay. the one hour test. Yeah. And then I had to take the, I forget how long it was. It's, it's like, like four hours. hours. Or yeah. Three or three. Or four. yeah. Mm-hmm. So I took that one and I passed that one. Okay. And so at that point they had just chalked it up when I had failed the first test and then passed the other one of, okay, well, because of your PCOS, because you can be insulin resistant, it just takes you a little bit more time to break down the blood sugar, to break down the glucose. So, you know, yeah. just, you know, eat healthily and you, you'll be fine. Yes. Okay. Looking back, I feel like had I stayed on my metformin, because it is safe to stay on when you're in pregnancy, uh-huh. that could have helped possibly, um, that could have helped, you know, control my blood sugar. But so we sort of like started to have that working theory of like, okay, so I maybe developed diabetes. He grew way too quickly. And, you know, then just the worst happened. Yeah. At that point, my doctor, um, she was like, I know that in your birth plan, it says that you want to have a vaginal delivery, but because he's so large, I don't think that your pelvis, like you can pass him through your pelvis. Yeah. He's just, it's just not going to happen. Like Mm -hmm. literally. (laughs) Yeah. And so she, she gave us the option. So she was like, if you want to try, we can induce you and you can try to deliver him vaginally. And some moms that, you know, are, have experienced a full-term fetal demise, you know, they want to deliver them um, because that feels right for them. Mm -hmm. But if you decide to do that, the fear is that he'll get stuck. And then you'll still, you'll have to have an emergency C-section at that point. 
or it could, because he's not, because at that point they're not helping you. Right. Like, yes, it's different than in, you know, a natural, like a live birth, right. Cause they're kind of wriggling and moving. And yep. so they were afraid it would cause like more trauma to his body. If yeah. I tried to deliver him. Yeah. And so my husband and I talked about it and we just decided like, let's just go ahead and do a C-section. It feels less traumatizing to everybody to, to have a C-section. Um, but because I had eaten that morning, we had to wait because oh. of the anesthesia. Yeah. So I had to wait five hours from getting the news that he had passed oh. to when we could deliver him. And okay. like at and the time, all- yeah, it felt cruel. Like it yeah. felt like I yeah. just want this to be done. But like looking back, I am kind of glad that it happened that way because I was able to kind of prep my mind and like think about things that I wanted to like do. And I I had had a friend or, or a, a girl I was friends with in high school. She had had a stillbirth um, earlier, an earlier term stillbirth, but um, I want to say she was 26 weeks or maybe earlier than that, but it was, it was over 20 weeks. Okay. Um, and she had posted pictures of her daughter on like Facebook and things like that. So like it had happened years ago. Yeah. But I remember at the time when I saw pictures of her daughter, like I just thought that it was so painful. Like, oh, I why would you want to take pictures of your baby? And like I hate that I felt that way. Yeah. Um, but I just kind of didn't understand, you know. But then it like clicked all of a sudden in my five hour wait that I was like, I need to have pictures of him because mm-hmm. I won't ever get to take any other pictures of him. Like mm-hmm. I need to be able to memorize what his face looks like and every line in his face and hair and, you know, all the things. So I started to kind of talk to my husband and, and then also I had had one of my coworkers, her brother and his wife had experienced a stillbirth, um, just the month before, um, because they had been, they had been in a car accident, a really bad car accident and they ended up losing the baby, but he was full term. Oh. Um, like I think he was like maybe three, four weeks away from his due date. Yeah. But essentially, um, yeah. Yeah. So I remember seeing pictures of him and it kind of prepped me to be able to prep my husband. Like when babies pass away in utero, like their skin starts to peel a little bit and like the body starts to kind of go through the natural process. So I like kind of felt prepared to like know the difference, like a live baby versus a deceased baby. Like this is, he's going to look a little bit different. So I was kind of thankful for like having that, like, I guess insight or, yeah, you know, like knowing like it, it felt like it would be less jarring for, you know, when it happened. So, you know, we were waiting. And then by this time, my husband had called my mom because she had known we were going to the hospital. And was just kind of on standby. Gotcha. Um, and so we didn't want to tell her like before she got to the hospital because I didn't, she lives about an hour away. So I was nervous. Like she's going to be on the interstate, you know, yeah. I don't want for her to like yeah. get in an accident. Yeah. Um, but I think she knew like she, she could I, tell. T- I had my husband call her, but she's known him since he's a kid. So yeah. she knew that something was wrong you know, got to the hospital and I asked my husband, I was like, I need for you to tell her by yourself. Like, I can't, I can't be in the room when she finds out my mom and I, my mom's my very best friend, but, um, she had me when she was young. My parents had me when I, when they were young. Um, and that relationship can kind of be complicated. I very much, I'm like, I feel like I have to take care of my mom sometimes. Like, That's just the dynamic of our relationship. So I knew like, I'm not going to have the capacity to come for her for this. Yeah. And not to say that she would make me do that, but just, I just couldn't do it. Like I couldn't handle it. Yeah. So, um, I had my husband tell her by himself. And then by the time she got to me, she was like in full mommy mode. Like she was just, what do you need from me? How can I help? Um, and just, you know, I'm going to, fully be here for you so they moved us to a room that was like as far away as possible from everyone else in L&D um 
which was great because yes. the whole time we were there, I did not hear a baby cry. Yeah. I didn't hear a woman in labor. And I was really concerned about that. I was like, I'm going to hear some woman having this tough labor and I'm going to feel like how lucky is she? And so we were kind of away from everybody and they had put like a sign on our door um, to let everyone know, like before they came in, like, you know, the situation. So no one would be like, congratulations, baby's yes. coming or like something like, you know, awkward and terrible. Yes. Um, so we were there for about three more hours. Um, but when we moved to the other room and so my mom and I convinced my husband to like, go get something to eat before we went to surgery. Gotcha. And yeah, that's good. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's it's still a Sunday. It's like Sunday still like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So at this time, it's probably like mm, probably like two o'clock, two, three o'clock. And okay. we hadn't eaten anything since like, you know, eight o'clock in the morning. So mm -hmm. um, we convinced him to eat something. So I was like, I'm getting hungry. Like he's got to be getting hungry. Mm -hmm. um, so he went to eat something. And my mom and I were just kind of sitting and talking and I kept telling her, like, I just feel like maybe they're wrong. Like there's, there's this little piece mm -hmm. of hope that maybe they're wrong and they'll yeah. deliver him and he'll cry and it'll be a weak cry, but he'll cry. And like, this will just be a mistake, like a horrible mistake. Yeah. And she just, she was like, okay, like, I hope that too, but. I think you need to prepare yourself. Right. And yeah. um, she was just trying to be like super loving and just supportive. And so we were just talking about like just nothing, you know, just passing time. And at that point I just told her, I was like, I just feel like this isn't my body anymore. Like I'm, yeah, I'm having an out of body experience. Like I feel like my womb just turned into his tomb. And like, I don't know how to reconcile that. Yeah. Like, I just felt like very trapped in the situation and in my body. Like if it, it was so weird because just hours before, like the day before I felt so great. I felt so empowered and beautiful and the giver of life. And then it on a dime was just the opposite. Like everything fell apart and a bomb went off in the middle of our world. So, um, my husband finally came back and my mom, you know, went and took a break. And I think she probably like called my dad or something, or I know she made a couple calls to like, let people know what was going on, like with an immediate family. Uh, and then it felt like we blinked and they were starting prepping us for surgery. And, um, so they brought my husband like the gown and the hairnet and, you know, all the things, all the things. So then they took me back to the OR ahead of, of him while he was, you know, getting prepped. And, um, they told me that it was going to be cold, but I remember like when we got into the OR, it was like freezing, like freezing. it's like, freezing. yeah, it's like it's, a meat locker. Yes. It's crazy town. How cold it is. <laughs> yeah. I was like, how do you work in this no, environment? Exactly. Like I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> So it was super cold. And I also like, <laughs> I remember thinking that I thought it was going to be so much bigger. Like, cause I watch a lot of Grey's Anatomy. So <laughs> there's loads of room in that. <laughs> so in my mind, the OR is huge yeah, and there's like a gallery and like people watch the surgeries <laughs> and it was, that was not, not the that. reality. That was not that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it was not the reality. Um, so it seemed so small and you know, they had like the little, like the baby warmer and all the things. And I just remember thinking like, will they warm him? Like, it just, it just felt so strange. Like, it was like, how is this going to be different from a normal birth, you know? And so my doctor met me in there and they, the anesthesiologist, um, you know, he had already explained to us like what was going to happen to do the, um, epidural or whatever spinal tap thing. Yeah. The spinal. Um, mm -hmm. And so he explained again what he was going to do and how I needed to like position myself to, so that he could, you know, get the needle in and things like that. Right. So I sat on the bed um, and my doctor kind of like held me and I just started crying. Like she was just so wonderful 
and like nurturing and like motherly. And she, I just remember feeling like just this bond with this woman that I've only met a couple of times. Yeah. She had like a gold cross that she was wearing. And I grew up, I went to a Christian school, but my whole family's Catholic. And Mm -hmm. so it just felt comforting, like to have, I don't know, just to know, like, she's, she's probably praying over me or I don't, it just felt great. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so she was just really nurturing when they were doing it. And she just kind of was hugging me and like kind of rubbing my shoulders as they were putting the needle in. And she was like, okay, so mama, now we're going to lay you down. And, uh, started explaining, you know, putting the catheter in and things like that. And, uh, once I was numb, it was wild. Like it was so strange. Mm -hmm. Um, the feeling of you don't feel anything. It's like from the ribs down, you don't exist. Yeah. Weird. But also you feel like pressure. So like I could, I could tell that somebody was touching me, but not really what they were doing or really where Mm -hmm. they were touching. Like, it just was very strange. Like I've never had a surgery before, so it was super odd. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It is weird. And then by that time uh, they put the drape up and everything. And my husband came in I could tell he had been crying again, um, but he was just like my rock. Like he, I was shaking a lot, um, probably because of the anesthesia and because it was freezing. So he was just kind of like, you know, holding me steady. And at one point I did kind of feel like I was going to fall off the the bed. Like the. They are tiny. They are small, yeah. little, like it is. I was like, yeah, I do. Yeah. Yes, I I totally really agree small. with you. It's totally small. It's so narrow. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I felt like he was kind of holding me in place. And then it just kind of seemed like it sped up, like somebody pressed the fast forward button and, you know, there was pulling and pressure. And then they told it was silent, but I could hear them say baby's out. Because they were record like they record themselves like I, I don't, I'm guessing there's audio or something like so that it, there's notes for the medical record. Oh, gotcha. OK, because like it was a silent OR except for, you know, making this incision 10 blade or whatever. Like it was silent except for that very robotic yeah. like procedure of the surgery. Yeah. And so then I heard babies out and I just kind of held my breath for a second. And then nothing. It was just silent. And uh, in our birth planning, I had asked my husband, you know, I really want for you to cut the umbilical cord. I want you to cut his umbilical cord. And when we were planning, my husband was like, oh, that's kind of gross. I don't know if I I'll, if I can. But he immediately, I just was like, stay with the baby. And so he did. He immediately, you know, went to see Sebastian and he um cut his umbilical cord and oh he did get to um, do that that's great yeah he he got to do that and they weighed him and you know got him kind of a little bit cleaned up and you know wrapped him wrapped him up and put a little hat on him and i could hear i heard my husband cry but it didn't feel like he was really crying like i don't know i just remember thinking like oh wow he's you know, really holding it together. And then later when we were talking about it, he was like, yeah, no, I couldn't stop crying. I just was constantly crying. Um, and then the chaplain we had, I requested to see a chaplain as soon as possible. And yeah. so the, a nurse had come to me like right after they delivered him, like that they, they were still closing me and everything um, or delivering the placenta. And um, she said, the chaplain is here. Do you want them to come in now or do you oh. want them to meet you in your room? And I said, I want them now. Okay. And so they came in and she was gowned. Um, it was a lady chaplain, but she mm-hmm. was gowned and everything. And she said, what do you need from me? And I said, I just need you to pray for strength. And um, so she did. So she just kneeled by me and grabbed me and um, prayed over me. And then my husband brought over the baby because I hadn't seen him yet. And so I saw him and he was so perfect. And it was like equally the best and worst moment of my life. (laughs) You dream about what they're going to look like and um, which of you they're going to look like. And 
he was just perfect. Um, and so then the chaplain asked, you know, can I, can I bless the baby? And I said, yes, please. Like I, in my mind, cause we, we would have have baptized him, yeah. um, in our faith. And <laughs> I remember feeling like I need to make sure he's in heaven when I get there, like, which thinking back, I laugh at myself because it's like, he was a baby. They're innocent, but, um, I needed to like all the bases to be covered. I needed, yes, I, you know, so she was like, is it okay? Can I, can I touch your baby? And I said, yes, please. And so she, you know, put the oil and holy water on him and, you know, she wasn't a priest. So it's not exactly, you know, the baptism that I would have wanted, but it just felt like, okay, this is, it's, this is a holy, you know, person ordained, it was, yeah. um, by God. And, you know, so it's covered. And so she did. And that felt special. Like, even though it was like in the midst of them, you know, stitching me and doing the things and it just felt like, cause it was just the three of us and her, like for that moment in the OR, even though there was all of the team of people around, it was just the three of us and her. And we got to have that, that little tiny moment. And then they were going to take Sebastian into um, our hospital room um, while they finished getting me closed and everything. And they asked my husband, do you want to go with baby or do you want to stay with your wife? And I said, you stay with him and follow him everywhere. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And so he did. So he went back to the room um, with the baby and to see my mom which also in hindsight, I'm really, really glad that she saw him before I got there just because I feel like, I don't know, I just feel like it was better. (laughs) Yeah. And so then they switched me, you know, back to the bed and rolled me in. And at that point, like, I just felt super out of it. Like, it felt, you know, like, exhausted. um, The anesthesia was, you know, weird, and I was shaking still. But so I was trying, I remember trying to be like, I need to get it together. Like, I need to get my together so I can hold my baby yeah so the nurse was still trying to clean him because you know when he had passed um you know at whatever point um his bowels had released so he had um meconium on him right okay yeah exactly so they were trying to clean him but because you know his skin was starting to peel a little bit Um, they were trying to be really, really careful about cleaning him because they didn't want to, you know, tear it further. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and and that's tricky because meconium is very sticky Mm -hmm. and and that, yeah. Oh man. Okay. Yeah. So they, they cleaned him as best as they could, but he, when we first saw him, he did still kind of look a little bit like yellowish, but my husband got to, um, you know, take pictures of his hands and of his feet and um he was so chunky Mm -hmm. um you know we went from thinking he was going to be this little peanut and now we call him our turkey because he was like a 10 pounder you know 10 pounder yeah (laughs) and it was right before thanksgiving yeah yeah exactly was was he exactly 10 pounds or was he a few ounces as well nope he was exactly 10 pounds 21.25 um inches oh yeah so really big and really Mm -hmm. tall Mm mm-hmm yeah. So, um, yeah, so he was a, he was a big boy, um, which makes so much sense. Like, that's why it felt so much pressure in my pelvis cause, yeah. or like the night before too, like looking back why it felt like he just was on one side. Cause he was yeah. such a big baby, you know, right. we just got to spend some time with him, but when they brought him to me for the first time, he was completely wrapped up. Like he was all in his little blanket and he had mm-hmm. his little hat and everything. Um, And so when I held him for the first time, I just was trying to remember everything. Like I was trying to memorize his little face and how it felt to hold him and how my body felt holding him and, you know, just his weight, like how his weight would feel. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, I just need to remember, I need to remember everything that I can possibly remember. And my husband had taken pictures of his hands and his feet. Um, but he hadn't taken pictures of his face. And, um, I asked him, I was like, babe, please, can you just take a picture of him? And he was like, I just, I, I don't want, I don't want one. 
And I was like, you don't have to see it. I never have to show it to you, but I have to be able to remember what he looks like. Cause I was terrified. Like I was just. Yes. Horrified that like in 20 years, I would forget what his nose looked like. Yeah. You know, yep. cause you think you're not going to have enough time. Yeah. So, um, so he did. It's so little time. Yeah, it really is. So though. Well, because like you're supposed to have their whole lives. I'm supposed to have. Yes. 18 plus years of photos and videos and. And looking at them and taking care Mm -hmm. of them and all the things. But no, you don't. You will not. You will not. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so he did. And, um, then, uh, I asked my mom if she wanted to hold him. And so she did. And. It was so sweet. She held him and she rocked him some. And just like seeing her become a grandma was like the best and the worst, but the best. Yeah. And she even said at one point, she was like, I'm, I don't even know why I'm rocking him, but I just need to know that I rocked him because you don't have to rock a still baby, you know, like. It's not for them, you know, but for us, Correct. like we needed to do the things, yeah. the things that we were supposed to do. Um, so we spent some time with him that first night. I I honestly don't even know how long it was because it felt like it was like five seconds, but, um, we spent some time with him. And then, uh, at one point, you know, the nurse asked, you know, do you, we're going to, you, do you want to take him back? Do you want him to stay in the room with you? And I think we were just exhausted at that point. And it felt like it would be too hard to keep him in the room. Like, just the whole time. Yeah. And I don't really know why it just did at that point. Like it just, it felt like too much. So we said it was okay for them to take him. And um, so he said, okay, well at any point when you, if you want to see him, if you want to spend some time with him, you absolutely can. As long as you're in the hospital, you can continue to ask for him. Okay. Um, Okay. So that was really good. Um, Cause it, it felt, it just gave, gave us a little bit of power. I think of, yes, you know, this is just what was happening to us. Yes. Yeah. That is great. They, you know, took him and what I didn't know at the time, but the nurse um, had gotten coconut oil and was trying to use the coconut oil to get some of the meconium off of him. Oh, um, okay. And, and was able to actually get the majority of it off of, of, off of him. Like gotcha. they were able to really clean him up really, really well to, to like bathe him. So, and was his skin still pretty good? How did it, how did it look by that time? So at that point, or at least to me, he had a little bit of peeling like on his little cheek, Mm -hmm. um, that I could see, um, his lips were really, really red. Yes. Um, but other than that, from, from me, like initially, cause he was all wrapped, I didn't really see a ton of peeling. There was some, um, on the pictures that I saw of like his feet, that my husband initially took, there was Mm -hmm. peeling there as well and on his hands. Um, But honestly, not a ton. Like it really wasn't a lot. I didn't ever get to see him unwrapped. It's not something you think about. Like, yes, I did not think about it either, actually. So I don't know why it didn't even cross my mind to unwrap. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think I was just so concerned because I mean, with any baby, you support their head because, you know, yes. but especially like because they're limp, like, mm-hmm. so I was so concerned with like disturbing his little body, you know, mm-hmm. like I didn't want to like hurt, hurt him or jostle him, you know, so I just, I don't know, like I was just remember feeling like I was being very careful and gentle and like not to say that like you should like you know not be gentle with a baby but um oh, but just like yeah you're like oh i'm going to tear his skin uh, yes right. you you just are so, yes you are so careful mhm mhm yeah so at that point i didn't really see a lot of of like peeling or or tears or anything like that we actually didn't really know the extent of the skin um until we got pictures back. So then like the hospital took pictures for us, which I'll go into. Um, but then we saw like that there was actually quite a bit of peeling, like on his back, um, and on his legs and things like that. Okay. 
So they did they did unwrap him mm-hmm. for pictures. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So um, so that first night we just kind of were exhausted and we were up probably every hour or so. Like one of us would wake up and then the other would hear them crying or vice versa. And so mm-hmm. we just kind of I don't know, like that first night, we just kind of bonded in the grief, like, and just were there for each other of like, do you want to talk about this? Do you not want to talk about this? Yeah. And I remember at one point he was still sleeping and I felt bad. I didn't want to wake him up. And I just was like, I logged on to like my um, benefits website for my job. And I was like, how am I going to be off work? Like, cause I'm like, I don't qualify for maternity leave now because yeah. when I did, yeah the, you know, pre like paperwork and stuff for maternity leave, I needed to provide them with a birth certificate in so many days. Well, that's not really going to work. So I I was stressing about that. And so I I had texted my boss and I had told her what was happening. And I texted her in the middle of the night, um, that first night and was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Like, I don't know how I'm going to be on a like leave of absence. And Little did I know, like the next morning she was on it. She called HR for me. She did oh. everything possible. For, like, I didn't have to call HR at all. She called me and said, I'm so sorry. Do you have a moment to talk that like the next morning, Monday morning and was like, I already called HR. Here's your case number. You're on a leave of absence for this long. You're going to be paid this much. Um, you know, short term disability covers this because the good thing for me, at least, was I had a major surgery, so I qualified. Oh, um, okay. so I qualified for paid benefits that at least like, I don't I know, know, honestly, what would have been the outcome if it was, if I had delivered Stupid. vaginally, Yeah, I don't know if the, sh- the time frame would have been shorter because they deem the recovery. Sh- I, I have no idea. Oh, God. Um, yeah. You got to love that paperwork that you had to deal with after. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that first night we just kind of played it by ear. And then at one point I was asleep. And like completely forgot what had happened, like didn't even realize where I was. And like, I was half asleep and I felt like a gush. And in my mind, I was like, my water broke. It's time. Like he's coming. And then I kind of came to, and I was like, oh, what was that? Like, that's not normal. Like, yeah. And so I called the nurse because I wasn't sure, like, did my catheter come out? Because I was still numb at this point. Right. So I was like, did my catheter come out? And then I was like, oh my, my hemorrhaging, like yeah, what's happening? Um, so I called the nurse and she came right away and she was so sweet. This nurse the first night was like the most incredible angel that ever existed. And so she was like, Hey mama, what's going on? And I was like, I just felt something and I don't know what it is, and I still can't really feel my legs. And so she was like, Okay. And so she checked and it was like normal. It was just like normal, like postpartum stuff, like nothing okay. crazy. Gotcha. Um but she was like, that's going to be uncomfortable. So she like, just very like nurturingly, like cleaned everything up for me and like, just was so sweet. And like, just the dignity, like, cause it's such an odd experience, right? Like yes. uh, you feel so hollow and like yeah. a shell of yourself that you were the day before. Yep. And so like, she just was so loving and like comforting and like, explaining what the heck was happening with my body because also this is my only postpartum experience like I have no idea what's going on so it was super amazing and then at that point I woke up my husband and I told him like what I had thought it was in my half asleep and then so we both started crying again and and then we woke up probably around like six we were like yeah so we're not sleeping this is happening yeah like we're (laughs) we're not really sleeping at all And then, um, the nurses came in for like morning checks and, um, that's when they asked, you know, we have a hospital photographer and we'd really love to offer to take you, you know, to take professional pictures for you, um, of the baby. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, parents want to have, you know, like, you know, family pictures and, um, things like that. And for us, it just felt off. Like, Mm -hmm. I didn't at the time want to see the pain on our faces. Like I didn't want to try and pose and be all smiley. It just is so, yeah. Yeah. Like it just felt off. Like, yeah. "Mm, 
a natural, so, like, yeah. Ugh. Yeah, for sure. And at first my husband like didn't want to get pictures at all. And I really like, that was really painful because I was like, what do you mean? Like none at all. Like I just didn't, like, I couldn't understand, but I was trying to be really cognizant of like, he's also experiencing this at the same yeah. time. So, um, so we talked about it a little bit and then, and the nurse kind of explained, like, it's whatever you feel comfortable with. Like, if you only want pictures of the baby, we will only take pictures of the baby. If you, it's as much or as little as you want. Right. So that felt better. Um, and so then we, uh, decided that we would take pictures with him just kind of laying on the bed and, like they were going to take pictures of him by himself, like before they brought him to us yeah. or after I'm, I'm really not sure, but they would take pictures of him by himself, like newborn type pictures. Yeah. And then they would bring him to us and we would take pictures with him. And then we would just get to tell her as it was happening, if we wanted to change it. Gotcha. Okay. So that's what we did. So at first it was just him. And then I was like, you know, let's take a picture of just with our hands, like holding him. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we did that. <laughs> it's silly, but during the week leading up to, um, our birth, I remember like I had done my nails specifically, like I had given myself a manicure yeah. and with the thought of, I was like, well, when I need the next love of my life, I want my nails to look cute. Like, <laughs> yep. So <laughs> I was like, I want to look my best. And so like now, sometimes like I look at his pictures and I'm like, dang, girl, good thing your nails weren't a mess. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's something. <laughs> no, right. In all of it. Yes. In all of this. Um, yeah. So um, so we took pictures. My one of my old um, coaches, when we got pregnant um, from high school, she was just like a mentor and like amazing. And she had sent when we got pregnant him a swaddle that like has his name on it. Like it's a custom swaddle that's yeah. like super cute and um has his name like in cute little font and our newborn outfit that we brought for him, he wasn't going to fit in. Like they asked like, do you have clothes for him? And I was like, yeah, but, but it, not that like it's not yeah. gonna work. Yeah. And they were like, well, we, we don't really have clothes here. And I was like, crap. Yeah, that's right. And then I was like, well, we can swaddle him. Like we can mm -hmm. swaddle him in the blanket and we have a hat for him. The hat will still fit. And yeah. um, so we did that. And so we took really cute pictures of him swaddled. And then I decided that I did want to hold him um, in the photos, mm -hmm. um, but I just didn't want my face. So I just wanted like for yeah. like the neck down, like yeah. pictures of me, like mothering him, but mm -hmm. like not, you know, my, my face. So we have a couple like that, that are super sweet. And then I'm, glad that we have and then we just they they ended up you know leaving and wrapping up and then we just spent some time with him and I felt like more like lucid like with it since it was the next morning um so I felt like I like I was really like being super analytical about it like I was like I gotta memorize him and I have mm -hmm. to I want to smell him which is such a strange thing but I just really wanted to. Yeah, you do. You need to smell him. I know. Yeah. yeah. It's a and, it'll and be yeah. That's how I knew about the coconut oil cuz I ended up asking cuz he smelled like coconut oil. Oh. Like he smelled really good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um so I ended up asking like why does he smell like coconut oil and they're like oh well that's what we you know use to try and clean and blah blah and so now I like, I already loved the smell of coconut oil, but yeah. like now it's like comforting in a way. Yeah. Cause it's like, Oh, it smells like my boy. Like, yeah, that's, that's, that's great actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we spent some time with him. And then I remember my husband at one point asked as I was holding him and just spending some time with him, like, do you want me to take a picture of you holding him? And I immediately was like, no, I just, I really, I can't, I don't. And like, that's the one thing, well, one of the things that I really regret that I wish that I had just let him take the picture. Like I didn't have to be looking at the camera. I didn't have, you know, it didn't have to be posed, but just like to have a record of me mothering him, Yeah, you know, it would have been nice. Like to, <laughs> cause it's in my brain, but like to be able to see yeah, would have been nice. So we spent um, a little bit more time with him and just kind of talked and 
I just remember I just, I had to kiss him. Like I had to kiss, I had to know what his cheeks felt on my lips and like what his little forehead felt like. And at that point, like he was cold because, you know, when I had told him the night before he was warm because he had yeah. just, you know, yeah. been delivered. Yeah. But um, because he had passed, you know, they had him like in the like cuddle cot or what have you. Okay. It turned okay. out the cuddle cot that was in our room did actually not work. It was broken. The hospital oh. had one, but it was broken. Gotcha. But they were keeping him um, in like another cooling bed. Like when yes. he wasn't with us, he was in a cooling bed to okay. like, you know, preserve his little body. Yeah. So he was very cold. But I remember I wanted to remember that too. Like f- that was important to remember like what, even though he felt cold, like that, that felt what that felt like. Yeah. Like I just, I needed to like commit to memory every single detail about him, you know, but I always tell people like whenever they ask like the things that I would change, like I would unwrap him and I would look at his body all over and I would touch his feet and touch his hands. And, you know, my coworker, like I said, her brother had lost a baby and they ended up losing another baby, um, having another stillbirth. And they got to do those things. Like, I feel like, cause they had experienced it. Like, not that I would ever want to experience this again, No, but no. at least with their daughter, like they had the forethought of like, I want to do all of these things. And like, yeah. you know, and listening to the podcast, like listening to your podcast or, you know, in going to support group meetings, you know, there's some parents that know that the baby is like, know ahead of time. And so they have like a list of the things they want to do. Yeah. Um, or even some hospitals give you a list of, like, this is some things that parents want to do, like give your baby a bath, change their diaper, change their clothes. Like none of that occurred to us. Yep. You know, you just don't have the mind for it. You yeah. Right. Um, I kind of wish that there had been like a, a list of like some parents want to do this or, yeah. you know, some parents want to give their baby their first bath or, you know, things like that. Yeah. But the hospital did give us like a memory box. Um. So the the nurse that we had the first night is actually the one that like put it together for us. Mm-hmm. Um, like she came in, she was so sweet. And she was like, I spent some time with Sebastian and he's so cute. And <laughs> um, she took footprints for us. So mm. um, she had got little footprints and she gave us like uh, four, four or five certificates that like have his birth weight and the t- his birth time, 531. Um, and uh, his, like his measurement and everything. And so we kept one, I gave one to my mom. Um, he gave one to, um, like his second mom, his, my husband's mother passed away, Uh um, in 2019 or no, I'm sorry, 2018, but like his mom's sister, his aunt is like his other like mother figure, you know? So we gave her one. Um, and then we gave, um, the baby's godmother, we gave, uh, baby Sebastian's godmother, one of the footprints, so, like uh, copies, yeah. so like everybody, you know, has their little piece of him to yeah. to remember and you know love on. And then we have a little lock of his hair, um, because that, that was I forgot to hair. say. That. <laughs> yeah, that was like one of the things. The first questions that I asked, I don't remember if I said that or not, was because I had a full head of hair. My husband did. Yeah. My brothers yeah. did. Everybody in my family has a full head of hair when they're born. So the fir- one of the first questions asked is, does he have hair? Like, <laughs> I just wanted to know. So funny. <laughs> so um, and he did, and he right? Did. <laughs> he did. He did. He had a full head of dark curly hair, just like just like oh. mom and dad. <laughs> oh, that's so great. <laughs> um, so we have a little lock of his little hair that I get to keep. And um, we even have they even did like an impression of his foot. Like there oh. was a little tiny um, yeah. like clay mold. Mm -hmm. Um, so we got a little impression of his foot and uh, there's something, oh, there's like little poems in there in the little memory box. Um, and so I asked to keep the little swaddle that we had taken his pictures in because I felt like I needed to like have something that was, you know, that was his worn by him. That was his. Yes, Mm -hmm. exactly. So that's in his little memory box and, um, his little hat that he wore is in his memory box. And it probably and yes. smells like him too. It does. I so I I I very rarely will open it because I wanted yeah, to you, stay. Yeah, you're but like it's in I a ziplock. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what you do. 
<laughs> but yes, it does. It does. It does smell like him. Yeah. Um, and um, so then they asked um, a little bit later, they were going to move us up to the other, like the next floor. Yeah. Um, Cause we were still like in that room that we had been in for mm-hmm. um, like observation and everything after surgery. Mm-hmm. And they asked, you know, you want to go with him? Like you can hold him while we move you. And I was so terrified that like, as they were moving me, like something would happen yeah, or, yeah. or somebody would say something if, you know, they saw me holding my deceased child as I'm moving through the hospital or like, I don't know, like I was just really concerned with like leaving that bubble. Right. We decided at that point that we would say goodbye. Oh, they still said, you know, at any time, even if you decide now, if you decide you change your mind, as long as you're checked into the hospital, you can ask for him. Oh, okay. Um, but it just, I don't know, like it just felt like continuing to like say goodbye and he would come back and say goodbye again. Like that just felt hard. Uh, we decided at that point that we would say our final goodbyes and, you know, told him everything we wanted to tell him and, you know, how much we loved him and, I kept apologizing, kept saying how sorry I was and um, how much we would miss him and that we would love him forever and um, kissed him as much as I could. And I remember one of the nurses was like, oh, that would be the best picture of you just, you know, kissing him. And I was like, at the time I was like, lady, shut up. Like, (laughs) leave me alone. (laughs) But like now looking back, I'm like, okay, that was sweet. Like you were trying to be (laughs) sweet. Um, and so then they, they, um, they took him back and then we kind of went back up and then we talked to our doctor and we were like, okay, we got to get out of here. Like, yeah. How, what's the soonest we can get out? Yeah. I still hadn't gone to the bathroom yet and I still hadn't walked. So they would not let me leave until I walked on my own yep. and I went to the bathroom. Yep. Were you feeling so, okay though? Were you? Yeah. I mean, for the most part, I was in a lot of pain. Like. I just, I was so, like, I felt like if I stood up all the way, like, my insides were going to come out Oh, um, from the C-section. Yeah. So yeah. I just, I was afraid, like, and also I've never had a major surgery before. Like, before this, I had my wisdom teeth out. Like, it, yeah, that's not, yeah, <laughs> this is not a comparison. Yeah, for sure. So. Yeah, it's not the same. No, not. Um, so, um, I was afraid to walk. Like I was really terrified to walk, but I wanted to get out of there. So, um, so we did spend one more night in the other room. Uh, and then finally that next morning I had gone to the bathroom. I had walked, but I hadn't been able to like go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Um, I was only able to like urinate. So finally, like I was able to eat. I was also really nauseous from the anesthesia. So oh, I wasn't yeah. able to really keep anything down. Yeah. Um. So I was still doing just liquids. And I think that probably wasn't necessarily like. Yeah. Not helping, helping anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that morning um, my mom had come because she had stayed with the dogs. Um. So she had come and I really needed to shower. Like I hadn't showered since Sunday. It's Tuesday now. Yeah. I really felt like disgusting. Right. But I was uh, like terrified to shower by myself. And I also I had looked at myself in the mirror a couple of times and like just felt awful yeah like oh yeah it's crazy like yeah you're like you look you you probably don't recognize yourself actually right yeah exactly no it's I was like who is this person like my stomach looked weird yeah I felt so empty and like in talking with other moms like I'm finding out like that's actually a really normal experience like regardless yeah um of just feeling like you're just this totally new person But then even more so to like feel like something was taken from you, like in this, like you were so full, you know, days ago and now like you're just alone and there's just this silence, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, my husband was like, do you want me to help you shower? And I was like, no, no, like I, I can't. Um, So my mom asked me and I was like, yes, like, mommy, can you please help me (laughs) shower? Yes, please. Yeah. So, um, so she did, and I was just so strange. Like, also, my mom, God bless her, like, she (laughs) was amazing. Like, she mothered me in like a way as if I was a toddler, like, and that's what I needed, you know? She just, it was, I don't know, very, 
strange to be have just have given birth and like be 30 something years old, 32. And my mom's bathing me. Like I'm in that shower of the hospital. It's like also not great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so she just helped me, you know, so that I would feel better and help me, you know, clean off. And then I was like really terrified that I was going to like rip something. Like I, I didn't want to like dry myself. So she kind of helped me out. Cause also my mom has had three C-sections. We were all born oh. via C-section. Yeah. Okay. So that was kind of helpful. Like yes. she knew she how knew. like <laughs> I was guarding everything, you know? Yeah. And then everything was good. I finally went to the bathroom. Yay. Um, and, um, the doctor was like, yeah, you can go. One of the nurses, this was like the only bad nurse that I would say like that was towards the end of our experience that like she just didn't know how to handle what was going on I had asked her like I know when my mom had my brothers like before we could leave they had the like the people came like for the details of like his certificate his birth certificate yeah I was like is that something that we need to do like does he still get a birth certificate and so then she was like yeah he still gets one and I was like, oh, okay. So then when will those people come? And so then she was like, oh, I don't know. And so then at that point, we were waiting. Oh, for, for them to come. Correct. And so then finally they came. And it turns out we didn't need to wait for them because he didn't take a breath. Like, yeah. I don't know if it's like this everywhere, but in the state of Florida, if the baby never takes a breath outside of the womb, you don't yeah. get a birth certificate. Yeah. Do you get a birth? So, do, you, do you get a certificate of stillbirth? So, um, yes, you, okay. the funeral home does a, um, a fetal, I forget what it's called, uh, fetal death certificate Okay, is what they call it. Um, so they came, um, and then finally told us like, you know, I'm so sorry that you, you know, were waiting for us. So you don't actually, they were really compassionate. The, the people that came, it was actually two yeah. people, I think probably cause the one lady thought she couldn't do it on her own. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, But they were very sweet and, you know, kind of explained what the process was and gave us um, like contact information for local funeral homes and things like that. So we kind of gave that to my mom. We were like, can you call around and just like so we can figure out what we're doing? Right. Um, So, yeah. And then my doctor came and saw us. Um, She kind of let us know, like, okay, so these are your options for like an autopsy and like gave us like paperwork to decide. And so we did decide that we wanted to do as much testing as possible. Okay. Um, we're kind of really analytical people. So mm-hmm. we wanted to kind of try and deduce like what it is that really happened. Mm-hmm. Um, so we signed all that paperwork and then we went home and my mom had taken everything. Everything was set up. Like yes. I had a changing the crib, right? The- yeah. Like I had one set up in my room and then also in the nursery, like yeah. everything was good to go. Um, but she had spent that night, everything was hidden. Like it was crazy walking into the house. Cause it was like, it was almost like it wasn't our house because yeah. it, for the last few months we'd been accumulating everything, you know? Yeah. But it, but it was good. Like we had asked her, like, can, we don't want to have to see anything. Yeah. But she was thorough. Like my mom. <laughs> was super thorough she had gone in my cabinets and like i had baby um like baby food cookbooks and like baby weaning books and cabinets in my kitchen and she found those like she went through everything all it out yeah yeah (laughs) like there was nothing to be found that's that's impressive um yeah it was super impressive so i didn't have to see anything until i I was ready to go in the nursery and see it myself yeah then my uh husband's uncle came and he was going to go with us to the funeral home I think actually this was, no, yeah, it was the same day. So he was going to go with us to the funeral home, um, but they couldn't see us till until the following day. So he was going to come back. And when we got home, there was like a ton of flowers, like friends and family and even neighbors that we didn't know super well. There was just a ton of flowers and um, friends of ours got us this huge bouquet of um of sympathy flowers but it was like this gorgeous arrangement of white chrysanthemums and i didn't know at the time but they are the november birth flower 
which oh. I feel like I should know because that November is my birthday. Like uh-huh. I, my birthday is also in November yeah. 1st. So, yeah. but I hadn't, I didn't know. And every morning, like during this initial like postpartum period, waking up and seeing those flowers was like everything. Like it, those particular ones, the white chrysanthemums were just, I don't know, like gorgeous. They yeah. just were the little bit of like, the, okay, I can, I can walk today. Yeah. I can breathe today. Like, I don't know. Um, and then friends from when we lived in Virginia, when we were in the military, that first night, they we randomly got a knock at the door. Like it was like seven uh-huh. and there was an Amazon grocery order and oh. we thought it was a mistake. And we yeah. were like, uh, this isn't ours. And they're like, yeah. Yeah. And so then they're like there and I'm like, okay, so we bring them in and I'm like, did I place an order? Like, what? yeah. Like, what did I do? Yeah. And so then we see the, there's like a card and it says Mm -hmm. like from, and it says my, like, it was a group of my friends. They like all pitched in and got this huge grocery order. Um, and I just started crying and I was like, Oh my God, this is so nice. Yeah. And it was cute. It was cool because it was like things that like they remembered that I, I liked that like were my favorites, like my comfort foods. Like I love cheese and crackers. Like that's my, Uh like love it. And there was like cheese and crackers and like little like meats. Like I'm like very much an adult lunchable kind of girl. Like <laughs> so it's a charcuterie. It like, it's a charcuterie stuff. Yes. I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah. I can be sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so there was like all of those and um just like just cookies and like things that it was like, oh, you guys put thought into this, like, man. Yeah, that's great. So our fridge was like stocked to capacity, like, because also when we were in the hospital, I told my husband, because it was only a couple of days before Thanksgiving. And I told him, I was like, we are not going to skip things. We're going to do we all the of the Thanksgiving. OK. Mm-hmm. <laughs> did you have so, a turkey? Fine. Yep. <laughs> sure did. <laughs> mm-hmm. OK. Because sure I had put in a Publix order before we left the hospital oh. of like, I want a turkey. I want yeah, mashed potatoes. Yeah. I yeah. want. Like we're not going to skip holidays because yeah. my my son doesn't get to have holidays, so yeah. we don't get to skip them. Like yeah. that was the we're, the mindset to get us through. We're we're doing this, yeah. We're doing it all. That's so cool. I, I like that a lot. <laughs> yeah. So I already had all of that in my fridge, and then this Amazon order. So I was then fearful in a way. I was like, I hope nobody else tries to feed us because yeah. we don't have anywhere to put it. Like, <laughs> yeah. so I, we ended up. I remember like we put a thing on Facebook of like you know, cause my husband had put on Facebook because we kept getting messages from people because people knew the due date was approaching yeah, or had passed. So in the days leading up, we had been getting messages like, where's baby? When's he coming? When's he going to show up? So we had put a message that we wouldn't continue to get those of, you know, unfortunately we don't know why the baby did pass and we, you know, appreciate your love and prayers and, you know, something to that effect. Yeah. So I, I posted, um, you know, thank you so much for all the support. Like we appreciate the flowers and, you know, things. And then I was like, and our fridge is to capacity. So thank you so much, everybody for the love. <laughs> Cause I was like terrified. Like I really, this is amazing. I feel oh, so loved, but yes. don't love me anymore. Like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Just hold, just, let's put a pause on it just for a second. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it was nice to like have that like outpouring, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so then my, um, my uncle-in-law, my husband's uncle came the next day. Cause for all intents and purposes, that's like his father figure. Yeah. Um, so then he came the next day and I was really having a hard time kind of getting around. Like I was moving real slow Yeah. and getting into the car was really hard. So we had called mm-hmm. the funeral home and asked, you know, were you ready to see us? And they said, yes. But when we got there, um, she was running, the funeral director was running behind with like mm-hmm. her last family that she was with. Okay. So they were like, is it like, is it okay? Can you have some lunch? And then you'll come back. And I was honestly really starving. It was like the first time that I'd really been hungry. Yeah. So I was like, okay, that's fine. Let's go eat something. So we came back home, ate, because it was like right down the road. It wasn't far. And then my uncle-in-law was like, why don't you just stay home? Like, you don't have to go. And I got like kind of forceful with him. And I was like, this is the only decisions that I get to make for my son. Like, I'm going. And he was just trying to be sweet. Like, yes. you know, he has three kids. He's yeah. seen a wife in postpartum. And I, I don't think he held it against me in any way. But 
I, w- I just remember feeling like these are the only calls that I get to make for him. Like these yeah. are the only arrangements and like, this is the only mothering I get to do for him. Like I need to be there. I need to understand like, what is the process? What are we deciding? Like I, all the, I can't be left out of these decisions, yeah. you know? Yep. So I'm also like, just because of like past trauma, like, I feel like I'm kind of good in a crisis. Like yeah. I'm the person that can like get it together and like right. get make the done. decisions. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So whereas like, I feel like my husband had a harder time during those conversations with the funeral director. We, when we got there and we were speaking with her, he, she asked, like one of the first questions she asked for like the information on the death certificate was, did he have a name? And of course my son's name is my husband's name. So like, that was super hard. Like he immediately started crying. And yeah. So then I had to like, you know, give the information, but like that process too, is like a little invasive. Like it it's just so strange and like I never would have thought of it you know yeah one of the things also that stands out that it was weird that it mattered so my family I'm first generation that was Mm -hmm. born in the states Mm -hmm. um and my husband you know immigrated from Mm Colombia and got his citizenship and it was important to me like that he was a U.S. citizen like because he wouldn't get a social security number right yes yes but like, I, I asked that. And then I thought it was strange. Like, why did you ask that? But like, it was important. Like my whole life, my family, my parents, my grandparents have always, you know, you know, we're so blessed to live here. And yes. um, we had to work to be here and like, you know, things like that. Yep. And um, just, you know, a lot of pride for everything we've, my grandparents have sacrificed for us to have this life, you know? Yes. Um, so that was like important to me. Like, no, like he's second generation, you know, like he, yeah. he's the first generation, generation on his dad's side, you yep. know, like, yep. um, so that mattered. And the funeral director was so, so kind. Like, I don't, I don't know if anyone's ever asked her that before or what, but she was like, yep, yeah, yeah, that's what it'll say. Like, yes, he was born here. Good. Like, Good. It was super nice. Um, but the questions they asked, like they, you know, asked, um, my education level and things of that nature. and. But they didn't ask about my husband's. And I was like, why does the state of Florida, why does that matter? But I guess like it goes into some statistics or something. Oh, yeah. They probably do have some epidemiological studies Mm -hmm. or something going on. That's interesting. Okay. So like that felt kind of invasive. Yeah. And I was like. That is weird though for the funeral home to collect that. That seems correct. seems weird. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, and also like. So my husband has like master's degree. He has multiple degrees. Like he has yeah, a master's yeah. degree. He has things. I do not. Like I'm very basic. And so I was like, he comes from educated people. Like yeah. we have good jobs. Like, yeah. It's like, it we're just, not, we're no dummies here. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Like, so that kind of felt weird. And, you know, just different questions like that and questions about the pregnancy and like, did I have prenatal care? And when was my last prenatal appointment and things like that. So it was like, I did everything I was supposed to. Yeah. Like, I don't know. It just was very strange. That is really weird that the funeral mm -hmm. home did that. That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I guess, like, for Florida, at least, that's, like, who does the death certificate and does everything. Like, there's not really any other person that would do that. Like, my the doctor doesn't do that part of it or anything like that. Oh, so interesting. Okay. I guess that's why. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. That makes sense. If that's the way, yeah, then that yeah. makes sense. But um, so then we, you know, kind of chose, we had talked about it and I initially wanted to have a funeral. Like I felt like I wanted to like that. We didn't get to have like a baptism or birthdays or things right. like that. So it right. felt like I wanted to have a funeral. But my husband kind of felt like it would be too much for him. Like he had, he was, you know, fresh off just having a funeral for his mom. I mean, it was only a couple of years ago at this point. Yeah. So he felt like it would be a lot. And then, you know, like I mentioned before, I had a family member that had passed during my, like while I was pregnant, Right. that kind of fractured everything. Yeah. And so I was a little concerned that like part of my family would either not come, which would be oh, devastating to me. Yes. Yeah. Or that it would just somehow like not be about my son. Like yes. it would, because there it was would... like a little bit of drama for my baby shower. So, oh, I was like, if this were to happen, like I will kill someone. Like, <laughs> I, 
So my babies. Yeah. Oh. Exactly. Yeah. So we kind of made the cho- uh, the choice um, to not have a funeral. We would just kind of have something like ourselves with my mm-hmm. mom, and we chose to have him cremated. The funeral director um, recommended a locket, so I have my locket that I wear every oh, day. Okay. And um, it has his footprint and his birth uh, birthstone, uh-huh. and it has some of his ashes in it. Uh Um, and then she surprised me actually, um, and had it engraved with his name and his birth date. Oh, so, um, that was super special. Yeah. That Um, was nice. And she didn't charge us extra for that part either, which was also, I would, you know, you would expect like, this is their business. This is, you know, how they make money, but this, I don't know if it's all funeral homes, but this particular funeral home charges you like cost for, cremation and yeah. like there's no like they're not they don't really make they're, a profit off yeah, of it they're not marking anything up just because this exactly. is exactly i think it i think it affects everybody like I, yeah mm-hmm. yeah um so that was like that was you know good because also like it's another cost you weren't really anticipating like i mean you know babies are gonna be expensive sure yeah. but like this you, is a funeral like it, yeah ex- yeah so <sighs> it's it's yeah you're kind of you hate to be concerned about something like that, but you are like, yeah. we picked out a little urn for him. Like, a, it was, it's a cute white urn. Um, it's like kind of marbleized. And mm-hmm. it, I also was like in a weird way, like it's kind of morbid, but I was kind of proud because we, we didn't, we couldn't use the smallest one because he was a big boy. So, <laughs> so there was a really little oh. one. And then You're there's like, like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Not our And son. then there's like a baby sized one. And then, you know, they go up from there. And yeah. I was like, we didn't, we couldn't use the little one. He was a big boy. <laughs> that's and I, cute. I say that to I'm like non lost parents and they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, you get it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Totally. It's just like, yeah, you got it. You got to be proud of your, your kids somehow. Like, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we picked out everything and, did all the things and then we were just kind of like in recovery mode from there um we had initially said that we were going to like my grandfather has a boat he's retired my grandparents are retired and they Uh live you know down in Punta Gorda so they live on the water so Uh initially we had asked them you know would it be okay like could we could you take us out on the boat and we'll spread his ashes oh and um my mother-in-law's ashes are actually in Colombia and so the plan was when we go to Colombia, we will get her ashes and we'll spread their ashes together. Cause oh. I, I wanted for like, I didn't want them to be alone, even though, yeah. I'm, but like, I wanted them to be together, you know? Yeah. I like to think of like, when I think of him in heaven, like I think that he's with her yeah. and with my grandmother and like, they are watching over him for me until I get there, you know? Yeah. Um, but when we got, we went back to Colombia um, this past summer, when we got there, we were like, yeah, we can't do this. Like we can't, we can't get rid of them. We can't spread them. So yeah. we still have them. We never okay. did. Um, my grandfather said the offer is always open anytime we want. He made us this really beautiful chest because my grandfather's just like, that's just what he does. He makes everything. Like yeah. he's just, you got a project. He's going to one that's going to do, do it. it. <laughs> um, so I was like, Papa, can you make me a chest so that I can put, you know, baby splash and stuff? And he's like, yes, of course, honey, I'll make it. <laughs> So he made this really beautiful chest that I have like his memory box in and Aww. I made a scrapbook. Um, when I was in maternity leave, I w- was like, I have to make a scrapbook of yeah. his whole life, his yeah. whole life. I have to, and I had to get it done before I went back to work. Mm-hmm. So I have every single ultrasound. I have oh, the, um, I have like the, like card, like the container that the Avadrel came in the injection, oh. <laughs> I cut that out. And like, that's in the scrapbook and like from literally conception to like the pictures that the hospital took, it's all in the scrapbook. And there. so that's in the chest. <laughs> that's so great. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, um, that's how he came. And we just kind of, ever since we just like, we made promises to each other um, in those first few days. We were like, this won't break us. Because I told my husband, I was like, that first night, I just remember being in the hospital bed. But like, I th- I'm terrified. Like, please don't let this cost me my marriage. We just, we made promises that this is, it might be work sometimes, but this is going to bring us closer and we're going to live for him and we're going to 
you know, have experiences and do things because he doesn't get to. Yeah. And like my husband ran a marathon that first year, like he trained and did a marathon and for him and on the inspiration wall that I wrote, he did hashtag living for Sebastian. And yeah. that's what we did. We, we are, that's what we're doing is yeah. we have the adventures and we do all the things. Also, I like to say like that first year was living for Sebastian. And then this year it feels like it's like living for each other. Like, Oh God. We keep, we keep going. Yeah. And that's what you need to do from time. Stephanie, thank you so much for sharing Sebastian with us. That was um, such a beautiful, tender story. And I, I am glad I got to know him better through you and his little legacy gets to, well, I guess he's a little big boy, right? Yeah. <laughs> his, his big legacy gets to continue on through, through your stories. So thank you again. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs>